and we are on camera. Today is Monday, February 5th, 2018, and we are in Coolidge, Georgia, at the home of Dr. Terry Turner. Um, my name is Sue Verhoff, and I am Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. Uh, Mr. Turner is a Professor Emeritus from the University of Virginia in Urology, and uh, he is also a Vietnam veteran and has very graciously agreed to be interviewed today for our Veterans History Project. Uh, Dr. Turner's history is being collected for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project in partnership with the Atlanta History Center. And I want to thank you very much, Dr. Turner, not only for your service, but for your uh, willingness to sit here with us today and, and talk a little bit about your background. So um, to begin our interview, if you could state your full name and your date and place of birth. Terry T. Turner, November 1st, 1945. And you were born where? Moultrie, Georgia, yeah. right down the road. Gotcha. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about your growing up years and your background, your family. So uh, I was born uh, in Moultrie, Georgia, uh, which is in Colquitt County in very southern Georgia. We're about uh, 60 miles above Tallahassee, Florida, actually. And I grew up uh, in the county on a farm. My father uh, was a general farmer, as they were back in those days. A little cattle, a little hogs, a little corn, a little hay, a little this and a little of that. Um, so we grew up in a, a, a rural environment. Uh, when I got to be about nine or eight, nine or ten, we began having chores to do feeding the hogs, feeding the cattle and the mules and the horses and all that stuff, uh, doing some work in the fields. And then by the time we were in high school, we were field laborers uh, for my, my father. Neither my brother nor I um, ever did any athletics because our father wanted us home after school because there were animals to be fed, fields to be plowed, <laughs> things to be harvested. So, um, uh, you know, it was um, for that time a rather typical, I think, um, rural raising in, in the South. Uh, we lived in a farm community where um, in a little community called Murphy Station uh, at the time, because not because there was a railroad station there anymore, but a, a railroad still passed by. The station was um, long decayed and, and abandoned, but the little community uh, at that time had uh, two Baptist churches and a cemetery, uh, a couple of uh, different little uh, country grocery stores, a few houses around. And we, our house was out on a farm by, by itself. Uh, but it was the kind of community where um, there was not a lot of money around, uh, but people had property, farmers had property, so they were like land rich, money poor. Everyone worked. Um, and while we didn't have any spare money, because everybody else was like us, we didn't think of ourselves as being particularly poor. Uh, and, uh, you know, the church was the center of the community. It was all the activities were done somehow uh, around one of those two uh, local churches until I went to high school. Uh, in our uh, county seat, uh, Moultrie, Georgia, went to high school, and that was kind of a change of worlds uh, because until, until I went to high school, if you had asked me what my hometown was, I would have said Coolidge, Georgia, which is across the county line in another county, but it's only five miles away, where Moultrie is 10 miles away. And my mother's family, are from Coolidge. So every weekend was spent at my grandmother's house on a Sunday afternoon was at my grandmother's house with all my Coolidge cousins. 
and their friends in Coolidge. So, you know, I thought, considered myself, you know, from Coolidge. And even today, we live on a Coolidge route, even though I'm from Moultrie in a different county. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, high school, uh, where I was really got my introduction into what interested me in the long term in science. And, um, you know, I went to, went to college. And at that point, I thought I had three options that I, I thought were something I might like to do. And one was uh, being a cattle farmer. I always enjoyed that part of the farming. Hoeing weeds in a big cornfield, in a cotton field, picking cotton, not, not my thing. But, uh, you know, cattle drives, getting on the horse, you know, and showing cattle, you know, at the county fair, that kind of thing. I sort of enjoyed, or being a veterinarian, or going into the milita military, because I'm in that post-World War II generation where my uncles, uh, you know, all my friends' fathers had been in World War II. I had a, a, a real, uh, an uncle I really liked who was a career military army officer and still in the, the service as I was growing up and I always looked up to him. So I always thought, you know, that was a possibility. Went to college uh, and got my first degree in animal science because of that interest in, uh, in cattle. And um, Where was that? Where did University you of Georgia. I went to the University of Georgia. And uh, I was there before Vince Dooley got there. And I remember Vince Dooley's first year, wonderful year <laughs> for football. Um, but um, then uh, on that military track anyway, I decided, yes, that I would, uh, at the time, all uh, healthy males had to go uh, become a cadet in the Army's ROTC, or, well, Army or Air Force ROTC program there. So I went into the Army ROTC. Why? Why? Uh, because I, that was one of those options I was, you know, considering about the possibly going into the military and... Um, but why Army versus Air Force? Uh, yeah. Because I loved flying, but my eyes would not let me fly. And so uh, I didn't go to the Air Force. Otherwise, if I had the p potential of being a pilot, I would have gone into the Air Force. Uh, but anyway, I didn't. And my uncle, you know, that I liked, he was an Army officer, and uh, so I, I took that, that route. And so this was uh, in the early 60s. I began college in 1963. Those first two years of college were, as far as I can tell, pretty much like college was in the 1950s, the clothes and the hairstyles and the way they did classes, there were no computers, your registration days were all done on a piece of paper in long lines, and it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think very similar to the 1950s college experience. But around 1965, uh, a change began to happen because uh, largely, I think, influenced by the war that was growing in Vietnam. The war went from 20,000 to almost 200,000 within a year almost. And so that really radicalized the sort of anti-establishment population that was growing around other issues, though, around uh, integration, had grown around the, the integration uh, issue, uh, poverty issues, uh, you know, uh, other uh, north-south issues. People um, well, uh, so 
uh, then, so the war just sort of added to this. And we were in that group of that late teens, early 20s, post-war generation, so that the dads of our generation, uh, by and large, you know, were the establishment and reacting against what the, some of these issues that the establishment was giving them, um, many in, in the uh, sort of anti-establishment group then had this war to focus on. It became an anti-war, anti-establishment movement. And of course, this was an age group that was in college. And so, and I was in college. So if uh, you had a decision that was almost a, it was a personal decision, but kind of a cultural decision as well, when you decided to go into the last two years of the ROTC program, because you had to be in it for the first two years. The last two years, you could take, uh, you could go into what was called the advanced course. And that meant you were going to be an army officer and you would be paid for your la in, in your last two years of college. You would get a, um, a stipend, which I needed. That was good. Uh, but and that was only part of, of the answer. Uh, I still thought that being in, in the military, the, there was a draft on. Uh, I thought having that kind of a common bonding issue with everybody else around you, like my father's generation uh, had by and large, was a good, was a good thing. Um, and um, so I, anyway, I, I decided, well, no, I, oh, I know what, and the other issue was that the draft was on, but so if you flunked out of college or, or dropped out for whatever reason, very likely if you were a healthy male, the draft was going to grab you. And so if you were drafted, then you were going to do what the army said you were going to do. If you uh, said, okay, no, I'm going to volunteer to be an army officer and stay in, get my commission, you at least had some choices. If you did well, uh, you could choose your what's called a branch within the army, whether you wanted to be infantry, armor, artillery, those are the combat branches. Or did you want to serve in the Ordnance Corps or the Quartermaster Corps or the Medical Services Corps or the, you know, the all the Chemical Corps? Um, some people, you know, they had uh, training or background that would push them in one or the other. A lot of them just wanted to avoid the combat branches, you know. And so there was a paradox there, or a conflict of interest for the Army, I, I thought, and that is you more guaranteed your choice if you did really, really well in the ROTC program. But a lot of those who were doing really, really well in the ROTC program and showing that they had the leadership and the skills necessary to be good army officers, when they got came time that they could pretty much choose their branch, said, oh, I want to go into the Quartermaster Corps or the Transportation Corps or the Signal Corps. And I thought that was not right. And I had done pretty well in, in the program. And I thought, you know, if you believe that you have the capacity to be a good leader and you want to try to save lives and to where they need good leadership is under the most stress conditions, which is in combat. So I said, if I'm going to do this and not feel the rest of my life like 
I left some other poor sucker to do a job that maybe he wasn't quite capable of, then that would rest on my shoulders. So I chose the infantry branch and said, if I'm going in, I'm going in all the way. Should, should we put a hold here? Sorry. On camera. So as I was saying uh, about um, Teddy, I'm sorry. That's okay. No. That's okay. Teddy, no. You could cut that out of your tape. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I was saying about if one has the capacity to lead and through uh, their training and what other people say, tell you you have this capacity, then I think there's an obligation not to put that burden on people with less capacity. You have to man up and do your duty. And um, I remember, you know, I was married at the time uh, that I was making this branch choice. And because of my background in school, I had an automatic, as a matter of fact, my first branch assignment, even while I was still a cadet, I received in my senior year, you went ahead and you got that first branch assignment. I was in medical services. That was a guaranteed, in my mind, a guaranteed safe and soft kind of job where I could have you know, worked in a, a hospital or a medical facility of some kind and uh, been out of the way of any action. But once I got that, I really started thinking about what I'd said before about uh, friends that I knew were choosing branches or, or opting for branches that were like that, sort of soft and off to the side. And I just, I thought, you know, man, you can't, uh, this is not right. And so uh, I, I requested uh, infantry branch and they were glad to give it to me. They said, what? They probably were thinking, what is this guy doing? <laughs> you know? uh, but uh, but I, I did it because I, I really thought I, w I would really be bothered by uh, sort of sitting off to the side while those with maybe less capacity um, to, to do that job were the ones that all got dumped into the uh, infantry branch. And when I got in the infantry school, uh, in the officer course at the infantry school, uh, I saw a lot of other bright young men who made that same kind of choice. But you also s saw some who should not have been there because I, I have the very strong feeling that they were those guys who did not do well, did not really have much of a choice, and the Army needed infantry officers, so they said, you, you, and you, at the bottom of the barrel here, you're going to the infantry, you know, uh, which put other young men's lives in danger. And um, I, I didn't think that was correct. And how, so, How did your wife feel about that decision? I'm not sure that she was cute. <laughs> uh, I don't think we had a sit down on that. You know, it was me every morning looking at myself in the mirror, you know, and going, you know, are you going to be able to do this? Look yourself in the mirror every morning the rest of your life uh, if, if you, you know, go the way you're going, you know? Uh, and I said, I don't think so. And um, so I did it. She, uh, she never reacted to me about it one way or the other. She just accepted that that's what we were going to do. And, uh, you know, that was the way it was. How about your parents? 
Mm, no reaction either. Really? I think they were. Uh, I think they were proud of the fact that you know I had opted to you know be in the army. Uh, sort of, a, it was part of that sort of do your duty kind of thing. They never said that, and my father sort of lived a life of doing do your duty kind of thing. He had not been in World War II. <clears throat> in World War II, if you were a farmer, if you had a farm, and you were the farmer, not just a, a laborer on a farm, that didn't get you out, but if you owned and ran a farm, we needed we needed food, <laughs> you know, and so uh, you were left to, to farm. So, uh, and plus, my father was kind of old when I was born. I think he was beyond the draft age anyway. He was born in, he would have been like 35 or 36 yeah. when the war began, and I think that was over the draft age anyway. So, uh, because he was 40 when I was born, and 45, so I guess he would have been in 41 when the war began, he would have been 36, that he would have been out of the draft. But anyway, his, his deal as far as engaging around, you know, in the, in the county and, and local responsibilities and stuff, is always you gotta do, gotta chip in and do your help out, you know. And uh, so I always thought that they were, they did not think it wrong or unreasonable or, or anything that I, that I did it. They were not, neither of them were the expressive type to say, I'm proud of you for doing that, you know, or, or, or even a lot of uh, I love yous. You, you, you had to read it out of their actions and their responses uh, to you, and so you, you you sort of had to learn to read the tea leaves uh, with with them. I think that was pretty typical of sort of the Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, you know, stiff upper lip kind of people, you know, Scots, you know, not to speak ill of Scots. I love Scots in Scotland, <laughs> you know, but. Uh, that was that was sort of the Turner side uh, of our uh, of our family. Um, One sec. Sweet boy. There we go on camera. Is the uh, wire hanging in front of the lens? Oh, let me check. Nope, we're good. Okay. Okay. Um, so I was in 1967, I found myself uh, an infantry officer. I was a, what they call a distinguished military graduate from the University of Georgia in 1967, and uh, was an infantry officer. I assumed, naive me, that I would graduate I would quickly get orders and I would be off uh, to the Army. I got my orders, but they said, we don't have room for you right now, so you won't be coming in for another nine months. That meant nine months with no pay, no income, nowhere to go. <laughs> you know, uh, I had to lift and shift really quickly, find a, a part-time job, uh, around Athens, we, at least we had a place to stay there. We could stay where we were. Um, and, um, and my wife actually had graduated early. She had gone to school every summer, so she graduated early and already had a job teaching, so we could at least have some income there. Um, what grade level did she teach? Uh, kindergarten. And um, it was during that year, that, that nine months while I was waiting, that I really got my first scare because that was when the North Koreans took the USS Pueblo. And I thought, oh no, all of a sudden, 
from going to what was a warm, at least a warm country to have a war in, they're going to send me to Korea. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to be sent to Korea to, to a war in, in Korea. And all I could remember was, I did remember the Korean War as a kid, like seven, eight years old, and all the pictures in the paper about soldiers, they were all bundled up and it was snow and sleet and the frozen chosen, you know, and all this kind of, I thought, oh, please, I'm a Georgia boy. <laughs> you don't send me, don't, don't send me to Korea for Pete's sake. Uh, but that all, thank goodness, died down. And so uh, when I went into the infantry school in 19, uh, it was 1968, which turned out to be Tet, Martha Lu Martin Luther King assassination, Bobby Kennedy assassination, I think the George Wallace assassination. The 82nd Airborne was called out into Washington, D.C., smoke billowing past the White House. And then a lot of guys in my class, we were all looking at each other with wide eyeballs going, are, are we going to be called out in our the streets of our own country. Uh, the 1968 was the Anus Horribilis uh, that uh, when people are concerned about today, um, you know, and our current administration and everybody's, a lot of people, most people uh, apparently are, are, are very unhappy uh, and thinking, oh, how bad it is. You should have been around for 1968. Uh, that, was, that was a grim year. But um, I got through infantry school. And that was at Fort Benning? At Fort Benning. Fort Benning. And um, there's another thing, too. That, I mean, people think that, think of a lot, especially young people uh, being sort of against the service, against the war. Uh, but a, a lot of people, to their great credit, uh, most people showed up for their draft board and they responded to the draft and they did their honorable service. And um, when I uh, got out of uh, infantry school, I had applied to airborne school and ranger school because I decided I was going to be an airborne ranger. Well, they would not let any of us go to airborne school because it turns out they had so many volunteers for it. All the classes were filled uh, out to a time that they were willing to schedule. So they told all of us in our class, uh, none of you are going to airborne school unless you're already assigned to an airborne unit. There were two or three of us that even you know, that already had orders for, for airborne units. So I couldn't go to airborne school, but I could go to ranger school. Uh, the first day I, when I reported to the ranger school, they handed me a Red Cross message that uh, my, my wife was pregnant. And there was a message from the Red Cross that she was having difficulty. She was near term and that I should take leave and come home. And they said, what do you want to do? If you don't, if you don't stay, you're punted from the class. You can't come in late. And I said, I, I don't feel like I have an option. Uh, so uh, I didn't get to go to ranger school either. Uh, I came to see my wife. She was living with her mother. Uh, in Moultrie. Um, it, it turned out that, yes, she was having a little difficulty, it turned out, and that, all that went well, so it was kind of a wasted Red Cross leave. Then I was assigned to the Aviation School Regiment over in Fort Rucker, Alabama, where I uh, was an executive officer of a door gunner training company. And uh, all these young 18, 19 year old guys were coming through uh, for training, door gunner training and crew chief training for helicopters. And I was there for uh, eight or nine 
months or 10 months, something, and got orders for the Special Warfare School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for uh, training as a, uh, an advisor, primarily on a counterinsurgency campaign called CORDS, Civil Operations and Revolutionary Development Support. Uh, some bureaucrat was paid a lot of money to come up with that, I'm sure. But uh, this was a program that was being run uh, by MACV in Vietnam. MACV was the central command head headquarters over what were called the USERV units, United States Army Vietnam, and that was all of the regular Army, conventional Army units, the 101st Airborne, 5th Me Fifth Mechanized Infantry, 1st Infantry Division, on and on and on. And MACV ran its own programs um, in every province of the country, there was an advisory team. The, the, at the country level, the ambassador has a, what is called a country team that are specialists that work in all kinds of things in the embassy. Under that country team were the province teams. And under the province teams were district teams. So you could be a province senior advisor, a district senior advisor, all feeding to the embassy. And under the district teams, not every district had one, but were what were called mobile advisory teams. And those were five man teams of army personnel, two combat arms officers, a light weapons specialist, a heavy weapons specialist, these are infantry non-commissioned officers, and a medic, all of them senior non-commissioned officers because they were going to be advising in their specialties as well, advising down at the village and hamlet level, the local village defense forces, while the team also was supposed to be helping in uh, rural development projects in the village or hamlet. That would be like uh, helping the village chief fill out a form in order to get some government supplies to repair the village market, or to get supplies for the school, or uh, to put in an application to get a teacher at the school. All sorts of things you might imagine that a small hamlet or uh, a village might need to do as a part of a government down at that level. And the reason they needed assistance was that out in our area, and I was down in the Mekong Delta, out in the Plain of Reeds, which is an area south of Saigon and west of Saigon on the Cambodian border, right where the Mekong River comes into the country. Uh, they were farmers and fishermen. The village chief probably had a third grade education, if that. So they were not attuned to filling out forms in triplicate, you know, uh, to do this and that, uh, or even the whole idea of looking ahead a year from now or two years <coughs> from, from now to get a project completed. They were farmers and fishermen. They were putting in things. They see the sprouts next week. You know, you get a sense that things are developing. You go out and fish and you have fish in the evening or you don't. It's not six months from now or, you know, a year from now to get the reward for what you're doing uh, today. So they needed a lot of help educationally and just culturally to work a government. And that's what we were there to try to help them do. <clears throat> now, the theory was for us to be doing that. The reality was that the pressures were largely on us to be in combat operations, to help and be training those local militia forces that were called RFs, the regional forces and the popular forces. 
or RF and PF. And the Americans called them the rough puffs. And we did too sometimes. Uh, but for the Americans, uh, it was a, usually a little snide or derogatory term. Not always, but derogatory because they were known not to be frontline soldiers. The, the Arvin, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the Arvin troops, uh, were also looked down upon by the American troops, but a lot of the Arvin soldiers, the Arvin units, were really very good soldiers. Uh, their leadership, like the, m most of the government, were often corrupt and uh, inefficient, but down at the company and battalion level, uh, these guys had been fighting a war for 15 or 20 years. They knew how to fight a war. They knew how to die. A lot of them, thousands and thousands and thousands did. Uh, that wasn't the issue. Their leadership and, and was, an, was an issue at the higher levels. Down at the village level, in these uh, RF and PF units, these were guys who had volunteered to stay in, to fight and be in these units because they got to stay in their local units. Their pay was lousy. Their equipment was lousy because uh, they were getting, at least for a long while, they were getting the whatever the Arvin didn't need, then they could, they could get. Um, and so when I first got there, my unit was all in World War II weaponry. And actually, at the Special Warfare School, we had been trained for this. We, we had M16s, we, you know, the Army, we had M16s, M79 grenade launchers, and I won't go through all the modern stuff, that uh, modern at that time. Uh, but we also got reverse training on World War II weapons. Thompson submachine guns, M3 grease guns, or sub, that's a submachine gun, M1 Garands, the old World War II rifle, M1 carbines, all this kind of stuff. We were trained them because they said, this is what your soldiers are going to, to have. And indeed, when I got there, uh, my first few operations were using these World War II uh, weapons. And I remember uh, being in uh, this first combat I was in was like this. And uh, we got air support from propeller-driven airplanes, the old A1E uh, airplanes, and a what was in uh, World War II in Korea called a B-26 and A-26. And it was like you stepped back into a war movie or something, you know? Uh, M1 Garands and old radios. He's uh, not the modern, uh, at that time, uh, radio. And uh, it, it was just bizarre. But soon thereafter, I would say after my first month there, they were all issued M16s. And so we were all sort of back in the same century again. Can you talk just a little bit about your training at Fort Bragg? So the uh, training at uh, Fort Bragg was the Special Warfare School is where the Special Forces receive their training. Uh, my training was not the Special Forces course, but it was a subset of the Special Forces course. It was field expedient uh, operations. It was field expedient first aid. It was. Uh, language training. We had uh, t there was we had a Vietnamese language uh, course uh, during the eight weeks that we were there. Um, you know, going through the the Vietnamese governmental systems and uh, Vietnamese culture, and uh, the idea was to, they knew we were headed out into the villages and to the Vietnamese people, so uh, there was a lot of enculturation. Uh, there about it, but uh, there was a large subset of the Special Forces 
coursework that was put there because we were we were sort of like a mini special forces team. A special forces team is 12 people uh, on an A team. We were a, a, we were a five man team, but actually uh, where we were stationed, there was a special forces team behind us in our province town that we worked with. They had airboats that uh, we operated with the special forces during the wet season because they had airboats that could glide over the water. And there was one special forces team a little bit closer to the border than we were at a place called Kai Kai. And I was glad for them to be there because we could see them getting rocketed at night, but the rockets couldn't reach us. So <laughs> we, were, we were glad to let them take the heat on that. But uh, we were always felt like, you know, uh, you know, when when Kai Kai was being rocketed, you could see the illumination on the border, on you know, around the over the horizon, and hear the crump, crump uh, of those rockets, uh, and you would wonder, you know, were they going to just move past them and come after us next, or or whatever? But uh, so it was sort of a an experience I'm, I'm sure similar to uh, what the uh, SF guys got out in their uh, outpost as well, because we lived in a we lived in this we had th this village called Tromchim, and there was a, one of these triangular mud forts uh, at the end of the village, and that's where my team house was, where uh, our team bunker, we had a, what was called a final redoubt that you had to design within the fort in case the fort was overrun. Uh, you had a final redoubt that was, uh, our team house was, you know, probably 12 by 16 and a bunker just outside of it that was probably um, five by eight or ten at most, and with a with a wall of mud filled uh, 50, 55 gallon drums in in the sort of pathway to get to it that could close everybody off. Uh, and when they meant final readout, that was your final readout that had your radio in it. And uh, if you got in that close, uh, it was going to be desperate circumstances. And we had, because they realized we could be cut off, this was a perverse Army regulation that was for our good, but Army regulations being what they are, it was kind of silly. On the other hand, we were not in the Army supply chain. Therefore, we had no army food. Therefore, we had no army sea rations, except for five cases of sea rations that we were required to keep on hand in case we were cut off and isolated and had no other means of getting food. We had five cases of sea rations, and we had them stacked over in the side of our team house. And we got some way or another, the Army decided about midway through my tour that, I don't know what stimulated this, but somebody came out to look at something and on some kind of inspection. It wasn't anything I was told about. I remember it, these guys just showed up. And we got in trouble because our sea rations were not stacked according to regulation. Regulation is that the sea rations have to be stacked with one inch of airspace between each case. And we were in violation of the rule that we didn't have uh, one inch of airspace for circulation, you know. Don't want those sea rations to go bad. Uh, and they gave us a lot of hard time about that when we were just trying to survive for the next 24 hours. Thank you very much. And uh, that I always remembered that as a kind of a, an irritant uh, 
burr in my saddle for quite a while. But uh, we were outside the army supply chain because we were living out in a Vietnamese village. And that was not only for food, that was for everything, ammo, anything. Uh, because the idea was the Vietnamese system is corrupt. So one way to try to make it work better is to put you guys on the advisory teams, on these mobile advisory teams, on the Vietnamese supply system so that you will see to it that the orders are, you know, for supplies are put in correctly, that they are received correctly, that nobody is grafting off at the top. Uh, that did not work well because, for one thing, being out in a village, even if I'm seeing that my guys are filling out forms correctly, it is nowhere to be seeing where you know, it's being grafted off at the province level or at the district level. We couldn't do anything about it. So uh, while in an army, an American army unit, you might have heard me say a while ago, the Americans think thus and so, or the Americans act that way. That was because in our mindset, we were with the Vietnamese living in their village with them, and we were seeing the Americans in the big American units, which were not near us, thank goodness, but when I was in the rear or up further north and seeing them, that was the Americans, those guys over there, that was not me. Uh, and uh, even though clearly I was, I was an American, it, it's a mindset that separates guys who did what I did from a lot of other Vietnam veterans because while you were there, you saw them as the other. And so now we are commonly Vietnam veterans. This is something you don't really talk about. You don't ever say this. It, and I don't even know if it's, I don't know what American soldiers think about this who are in the conventional units because they probably not thought much about it because they would never see someone like me. Uh, it, it would be very rare. I mean, I never saw them during my year, but there were MAT teams up in areas of the country where there were American units. Uh, but there's always this sort of level of thing that I'm not like you guys. You know, I don't, I don't have, on the one hand, I, so I don't share your experience in, in that sense of being with, you know, I was not in an American infantry platoon or an infantry company or anything. Uh, now as a veteran, I don't have an association to go to like most of you guys do. You know, there's no, there's a, there's a first CAV, uh, uh, you know, association, uh, 101st Airborne Association, an association for this and this and this. and all kinds of American Army units. There is no uh, association for MACV because MACV no longer exists. It dissolved at the end of, in, end of the war where those other units survive. All those other American units survive. Well, I mean, most of them uh, do. Some of them, yes, have been demobilized. But um, so there's a separation of experience that persists through till today. I only belong to one uh, veterans group, and it's a small veterans group called Counterparts that I belong to. And we're all former uh, advisors. And uh, we can relate to each other, but find it very difficult to relate to the American army experience because uh, we, I can only speak really personally for me, took offense very, very often at what the American army, what we saw American army units acting like uh, to the Vietnamese. That's not to say I don't understand that acting when you are with an American unit and they, the Vietnamese, are the different people. And they are the threat as you perceive it. 
um, and you have to bond together with somebody and it's going to be your fellows. I understand that. So I, I don't cast blame, I just say it's a reality that uh, when I saw uh, American interactions with Vietnamese on occasion that was snide, condescending, uh, antagonistic to uh, conventional Vietnamese um, left a very sour taste in my mouth about... Talk, talk uh, about that just a little bit. What were some of the things that you saw? Well, uh, one of them, the, the, the most common kind of thing was sort of in the, in the background. You know, what you would hear if I would go for a brief period of time, the 9th Infantry Division was still in the Delta for the first couple of months I was there. They pulled out soon after I got there, so that's why I said there were no American units near us. The nearest American, really, ground forces were over 100 miles away, above Saigon, or around Saigon and above it. For a while, the 9th Infantry was at a place called Dong Tam, which was, um, I don't know how far, probably 30 miles or 40 miles away. And my understanding is that over the years they had been there, they had operated in our area before. I, I don't know that, but um, they were in the Delta. The 9th Infantry was in the Delta. And I was back at Dong Tam uh, on occasion, on one occasion. Um, actually, I came through Dong Tam for, they, since the MACV knew we were going to be out on these teams, small five-man teams by ourselves, they said, your first indoctrination of fire ought to be where you've got some support. And so we're going to put you with the 9th Infantry for a week. I think it was for a week or 10 days. And you'll go out on patrols with them and just kind of get your bones loose about combat and ambushing and all that sort of thing. And, uh, and that's, what we, that's what we did. And um, just in that experience and hearing and seeing and feeling uh, the 9th Infantry guys talk and a response uh, about uh, what was going on and what they would sort of say in passing about Vietnamese in a village over there that they had to go check. You just knew there was, there was definitely a separation, an off-putting, and, uh, you know, ref I don't know if it was a ninth. I don't assign this to anybody in particular. I assign it to people in general, uh, you know, referring to them as, you know, slopes and dinks and gooks and all that sort of thing. Uh, I come from the American South. I understand, believe me, I understand about one group calling another group, you know, derogatory names. Been there. I don't doubt, I don't specifically remember, but I don't doubt that I've done that. Uh, I, but I know, I know the psychology behind it as well. And, uh, and, I, and I know what that does to relationships. And so um, I guess I was sort of sensitive to it uh, and didn't like it uh, just as a general thing. And on one occasion, uh, I was back somewhere. I had been sent back to where an American unit was. I don't even remember what it was. It was up north of Saigon. It might have been with the 5th uh, or, or the 1st Infantry Division. But in any case, I and one of my teammates um, were there for something, I, I don't remember. But because we were advisors, you could tell that if you were paying attention, because I don't remember exactly what we were wearing, but if you were an advisor, you, you sort of dressed that way because you were running a war on your own and you 
you could kind of, within limits, dress like you wanted to dress, wear whatever uniform you kind of wanted. So um, we would wear the uh, Vietnamese blue berets with the Vietnamese insignia on them and uh, Vietnamese rank insignia on the front of your uh, jungle fatigue blouse. Or you might even be wearing tiger stripe fatigues, Vietnamese fatigues, but ways that marked you as not being in an American unit. You weren't doing that to mark yourself necessarily, but it was sort of a, uh, a perk you got for uh, being out of the way, you know, that Nobody was going to tell me every day what I should wear because I was the man in charge, <laughs> you know. Nobody was going to see me. I was a hundred miles away from anybody else. Well, not from anybody, but from, from uh, American Army units. And um, so I know that we both had on blue berets. And as we were walking uh, past this Army artillery unit, there was a, near a little village, and the villagers were walking back and forth in this roadway and bicycling, and an old lady was coming either to or from the village market. There was, I remember there was some uh, French baguettes uh, in her little basket, maybe some uh, green vegetable of some kind or something. This old lady, age is very respected in Vietnam, uh, and this jackass American soldier steps out from behind a revetment of that artillery piece there. And they, they were kind of joking and joshing. And he stops this old lady. I'm, I'm walking toward this as I see this happening. And the, the two or three guys around were laughing. And he kind of takes, he, she steps off or he tells her to get off or something. And she's one way or another separated from her bike. And he, in kind of a wobbly way, kind of rides off, and all these guys are laughing, and this little old lady is protesting, and he's completely ignoring her. And, I mean, even to, that just pisses me off. And I was outraged. I'm outraged right now, to tell you the truth. But I was outraged, and... Uh, when he, when he uh, reached me, I basically gave him a, he came, was came, I gave him a butt stroke with my M16 and knocked him off the bicycle. And uh, he got up and was kind of stunned on the one hand. I think he didn't know what I was because I had this weird uniform on. Uh, he would have seen my uh, Amer if I had I, if my American rank insignia and in the Vietnamese, though he probably didn't know what that meant. But my NCO was with me too, and he had my back, and so there were two of us. And, but all these these, these other guys kind of came up, and this guy was what are you doing, and and all this, and I was uh, I kind of locked his heels, and he realized I was an officer, and. Uh, I gave him really a bad time there for, for a minute, all of them, and made him walk that bike back to that lady, you know, and give it to her. He couldn't speak Vietnamese, but I spoke some Vietnamese at the time. Uh, and, and I remember you would say, Xin loi ba, which means I'm sorry, older lady, you know, uh, married lady, basically. And uh, and uh, tried to well, I didn't explain anything, but I just said I was sorry and made those guys go. They were kind of rough, but their their lieutenant had come up, and I lit into him. I said, "How are you letting these guys do this? You know, this is only making our case worse here. This this happens, you know, a, a ten thousand times up and down the country, and it's making our job." incomparably worse and uh, and frankly when this kind of attitude leaks down into my village where I don't have a, 
a thousand other GIs around me for protection, you know, you're hanging me out to dry because, you know, uh, some guy who saw this, his mother may live in my village and, and he may get you know, a bad attitude or and, and, and come back and join the local Viet Cong or something for all I know. I mean, it's just terrible. And, you know, he was trying to calm me down, you know, and saying, he said, and, I, and to give credit where credit, he was saying and explaining his problem, which was his troops attitude from just being there in this unit, they were just sitting there, not going anywhere, not doing anything, waiting on their artillery calls uh, if some action happened where they were needed. So they had a lot of kind of spare time on their hands. And uh, just as their officer, he just had a terrible time with them just to avoid mutiny, according to him, you know. So if he was going to be picking at them about every, from his standpoint, every little uh, violation of courtesy that they did, he would have even a worse time, you know. And so uh, he felt like, you know, he was in an impossible situation as well. But it was that, it was that kind, of, uh, kind of thing that I knew, not just from my experience, but from what other people said and experienced that, uh, this kind of uh, American attitude toward the local people, disrespecting their culture and customs, uh, was a, was a real problem. I, I think I I said in uh, Once a Warrior King that you know a 19 year old uh, aggressive American soldier, and if you're going to have a soldier, you want him aggressive, <laughs> you don't want him passive, you know, testosterone uh, pumped. It has about the sensitivity of a tank tread. Uh, and so you're expecting a bit much, you know, for them to be the warm and fuzzy all the time. Uh, but it's a challenge that our armed services need to acknowledge and train against up front. And... Uh, it's been a problem in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's something we should have known and trained about. Um, I've had uh, discussions and, and written a book uh, later, uh, more recently, uh, about it, where uh, these counterinsurgency experiences, different wars are caused by different causes, Islamic Fundamentalism is not communism, but counter. Uh, but insurgency is an insurgency, and counterinsurgency is plays by the same general rules, uh, no matter where you are. And and our armed services, unfortunately, forgot, put aside, brushed over the lessons learned in Vietnam. To some extent, I think, because Vietnam became a bad word and you didn't want to be saying in the armed services, well, you know, in Vietnam we, whatever, because Vietnam wasn't a good experience. You'd rather say, in World War II, you know, we did thus and so and thus and so because that was a positive uh, experience. But anyway, uh, there was this, from a, between advisors and the conventional army unit, uh, and maybe between the special forces and conventional army. I, I can't speak for the SF guys, but uh, there's this kind of a uh, little bit of a, a, a separation of experience where you were doing, you were fighting the same fight, uh, experiencing the same in the combat units experiencing the same uh, difficulties and the same uh, threats to life and limb, the same discomforts. Um, but you were doing it in a, a different way with a different set of priorities and attitudes that uh, made you not always going in the same direction. To jump sideways just a little bit, how, looking back, 
How well do you feel your training at Fort Bragg prepared you? Oh, I thought it did as well as you could. Uh, you know, it's like they tell you about taking a, a language, you know, you can, you can learn the words and the, the syntax in, you know, Spanish 101, but you don't really learn Spanish till you go there and get submerged in Spanish language or whatever the language is, you know. It's that kind of way about any war experience. You can learn the technicalities and, and uh, they can tell you about the experience, uh, but you don't really get it until you get there. And, um, but I think the training, they, they, they tried very hard to, to cover the ground. As it often happens, there is a, a system set up to do training that covers, say, all the appropriate ground. But maybe originally something was designed to be a 12-week course, and somebody says, no, we can't really afford that 12-week course, but let's do a 10-week course. Okay, well, tell you what, we'll drop that part, but we'll get the literature and give that to them and, and tell them to read it for background or something. And so what is, so it's still formally in the course, but you don't really spend much time on it. It's like also happens with units, you know, they'll say we're going to send the 1st Infantry Division. Well, an infantry division is, is made up of, you know, brigades and battalions and companies and, and platoons and squads. It's supposed to be, well, back in my day, I don't know what they are now, the 10-man squad, or basically a 40-man platoon, a four platoon, 150 men. By the time you add in some extras, uh, only you can count on up like that. But you find out you only have half that number of men there in the division because the squads only have four or five men, the platoons only have, you know, 20 or 30, the company only has, you know, 75, or, or I mean, I don't know those exact numbers by any means, but they're way under strength is my point. The, that uh, it's like the units just became an accepted thing. Your units are going to be under strength. So it's kind of like that in the training sometimes, I think. You know, the, the training ideally is one thing, uh, but sometimes can get under strength because of various priorities that get that get set up. Uh, I don't know the situation currently, but uh, I think our training was 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 very good. Uh, I know that some of it that I got, I got from just reading on my own from materials they gave us, and I, I can't say that I know everybody did it. You know, I just happened to be interested in, in some of the things, you know, that uh, was there, and I, and I read them. But um, it, it, I thought it was good training, it was very handy uh, to me, things I didn't get at the infantry school. Um, some things you can never train for. Uh, an example is sampan operations. There's nothing in the in the school books about how to have a light infantry operation in a sampan. You know, uh, how do you spread your forces? You know, uh, how do you uh, get in any cover when if you jump out of that sampan, <laughs> you might just drown. You know. And, uh, there are techniques that uh, you have to develop, you know, from the people you are supposedly advising are going to advise you on how you should do this kind of thing. So, uh, uh, but anyway, that, to answer your question, I, I thought it was, I thought it was good. So, um, I got th through that training and was assigned, as I said, to MACV Chords. I was assigned down in the Delta, out on the Plain of Reeds, uh, to a five-man mobile advisory team, where we were tasked to do what I explained before, but a specific I don't, you know, I guess everybody has to have a metric of something, and they said, 
Your goal is to run at least three combat operations, uh, three, three ambushes uh, a week, and, uh, but then you have day combat operations as well. Well, you only have a five-man team. According to the uh, Geneva Convention, your medic is not supposed to you know, be a combat operator, but believe me, when you're out there, uh, my medic carried a weapon, you know, uh, and uh, so you had to take your time, your, your day in the barrel, so to speak. So you'd always, in theory, you were supposed to always go out two by two. You were never supposed to go by yourself. But again, on occasion, you'd be undermanned and you had to do the operation. I've been on operations by myself with no other American support. So if you got wounded or killed or whatever, uh, you know, you'd really be on your own. But generally, you, you would go two by two, so there would be two men out on a night operation. The next day, they would come in and sleep, so the two men that had been in that night would go uh, on the day operation. The next time, you would shift over one, and the guy hadn't gone yet, and then he and one of the other guys would go, and you were just constantly going like this. And during the day, after I'd come back from night operation, ambushes and things, Many times that day I would have to go meet with a village chief or go to a hamlet out to look at something or provide something. It was just 20, almost 24 hours a day. And if night issues came up, my guys would always make me up because I was the team leader. And if it was about having airstrikes or needing some emergency action at night, I would always get, if I was there, I would be waked up, you know, so it was like, you're just always, always just exhausted. And uh, which was why you intentionally gave your guys about once a month, you would give at least one of your guys uh, a reason to go back to the rear for, uh, you would claim he had a pay issue or something. That way he would get sent back to Kanto, which was the Delta capital. And there were a lot of American, there was an American air base there, PX, um, relatively safe haven. He could just kind of relax in, you know, he could spend a weekend or two or three days back there getting his pay issue straightened out. And then he would come back, you know. Now these combat missions that you were doing two by two, uh, you were folding the the... RAFs and the PAFs in with that. Correct? The RFs and PFs, yes. Yes, RFs. The, and PFs. the they uh, that's right. You would be going out with them. You would be taking out uh, um, uh, a, a night ambush, say with a squad, uh, four or five Vietnamese uh, RFs or PFs. You would go out and set up an ambush and be out there all night, um, and then come back. You'd usually break ambush. Um, you know, at first light of dawn, you know, somewhere around there, you'd want to come out of the ambush before it really got light because you didn't want them to see that you had been in that particular location. So say four o'clock in the morning, 4.30, you'd break the ambush. You would go on it at, you know, the previous evening, depending on when, whenever it was light, whenever it was getting, you'd go out a little before dark. And about dark 30, you would arrive at your ambush position and try to leave just before uh, light in the morning as well. And what was the overall purpose generally? Oh, you would be trying to, you would get intelligence that a unit would be coming in through a certain canal, or you would hope that maybe you had no intelligence. You just, you were trying to cover what you thought might be a, a, a common route that they would use if they were coming through. You would set up ambushes, uh, you know, to, to ambush the Viet Cong. We were close enough to the border. There was a sanctuary area across into Cambodia from us. And what the uh, NVA and the Viet Cong liked to do was to get past us because their target was getting into Canto or to Saigon or the bigger cities, Sadek. Um, 
And so what they could do is they would, on sampans or by walking, whether in dry season or wet season, they could come in and get after, in one night, <clears throat> they could get into sort of the tree lines into my province. It had been about a, we were about, as I recall, about 10 miles, 10, 11 miles from the border. So they could come in and they could get into the tree lines in my area and hang out there and then the next night get past us and going in toward Kinfal, uh, Kowloon, the, our province town, or wherever they wanted to go to bigger targets than us, you know. And only the local Viet Cong would be the people we would have to deal with as far as aggressively, uh, them aggressing on us. Uh, but the guys from the sanctuary areas were trying to get by us. So we, uh, border, border interdiction was one of our sort of issues as well. We were in what's called the, was called the 44th Special Tactical Zone. And that was basically a strip of provinces along the border. And uh, we were to be doing some special things to, not to, if me and my five guys, you know, bumped into an NVA regiment, they were not expecting us to stand in the way, you know, but we were to maybe kind of, you know, slow them down or pepper them or, or something to distract them maybe a second or two, but basically to say, hey, these guys are coming in, you know, to warn, warn the units behind us that, that they were coming in. Um, but we, in our day operations were to, like, to be out searching and looking for wh where they would hang out, uh, waiting, or the local Viet Cong areas, sanctuary areas, where they would have camps and things that they would be, um, you know, uh, operating areas they would operate out of to come out at night to try to tax the hamlets or uh, Bately said tax. They were basically just bandits holding them up for whatever money they could get. Uh, fishermen who would be out setting their night fishing nets and stuff, you know, that was always an issue. Uh, uh, we had a curfew because we wanted, we didn't want people walking around outside the villages when we were setting up ambushes. So we had a curfew and we were pretty hard about it, but the villagers, they have their lives too. And they, you know, somebody gets sick, then somebody's mother from one end of the village wants to come see their daughter at the other end. And then they're gonna come with their son. And all of a sudden you got two or three people wandering around at night around the edge of the, and it could get very dangerous. And uh, so, or people, if fishermen on a boat in the wet season, moving from one net place to another. For all we know, it's a supply boat moving, you know? Um, and you, it, it's a terribly difficult thing. Uh, you don't want to attack the wrong people, but you don't want the wrong people attacking you either. So it was a difficult thing. I was at the, what I did, we had to keep logs, log books and they were to be turned in every so often. And uh, when I lived in Charlottesville, I was, somehow I was told that the MACV materials were in the National Archives and that you could go there and see what was there for your province or your, even district, uh, your MAT team if they had the logs. So I went there one time and lo and behold, there were a few log books, my log book, was there and uh, a folder of documents from the province, my province in the year I was there. And I was looking through, <clears throat> they were, uh, had just been declassified, but they were redacted. I mean, they was all blacked out. You couldn't tell much about what we did because it was still classified, you know, and, um, and not much could be said about it uh, even then, but, um, you know, we were running intelligence. You did a whole lot of things. You were doing the little, trying to do a little bit of development. To, the whole point of counterinsurgency is to win the loyalty of the people. 
not to just make them quiet and subdue them so they're not shooting at you anymore, but to actually win their loyalty more than the other guy can win their loyalty. So that, that's why in development projects, uh, you know, improving their lives is equally important with combating the bad guys. But um, I forgot why I was telling you that. But uh, logbooks. Sorry. It started with the logbooks. Oh, the logbooks. Yes, yeah. and so, uh, but a lot. Yes, a lot of what we did uh, was. You know, running also, though, we're, we're running intelligence cells and gathering intelligence and uh, sort of running spy networks, you know, out in the rustic rural villages of Vietnam. Uh, you know, we, we got some support money and there were some very loose contacts, you know, that you had to have with the CIA and um, this kind of thing. Um, but also we'll, along the border there, there are issues about border warfare having to do with international law and all this kind of thing. And so they redact a lot of that stuff and keep it uh, secret, you know, of what, what, you, what you do, what you did and all that kind of thing. Um, but, we, you know, so we were out there pretty much. We were on our own doing what we could, you know. Um, when I had been there for two or three months, they, the Vietnamese government made a new district. And it was around me and my team. Not that they did it just because I happened to arrive with halos and shining armor, but they had already, they were, they were going to uh, do it anyway. Uh, but that's just the timing. It happened while I was there. And so then all of a sudden, even though I was only a first lieutenant at the time, I became a district senior advisor, which was a slot for a field grade off a major and um, so I was now a MAT team leader and a district senior advisor because they were going to use my MAT team with its requirements also as the district team. So now I report to the province senior advisor who reports to the embassy, you know, and um, um, that meant that I had to fill out uh, other reports, more paperwork for me to do out in this village <laughs> where, you know, we don't even have electricity, no running water, and they're sending me computer printouts, you know, the old IBM computer printout stuff, and I'm going, this, this world <laughs> does not relate to my world at all. But there were two uh, reports. Uh, a Hamlet Evaluation System report called a HESS and a TEFIS, Territorial Forces Evaluation System report. They were all computer printout things. This was uh, the reasonable idea, uh, not reasonably performed, but a reasonable idea from the McNamara data gathering. He was a, a data geek. And uh, I understand that being a scientist, I, I understand the need for data. Uh, and also um, Bill Colby, the CIA, uh, I think was also big, in, big into this. The idea was to down at the hamlet, I mean at the village, the district level, have evaluations of what was going on in the hamlets and the ter and, and the uh, well, with the hamlet like living and government and their territorial forces, which were the RF and the PF we talked about. And so every RF unit, every PF unit uh, in my district, and for every hamlet in my district. I had to fill out one of these 
multi report things. Well, like all paperwork, it gets done on the fly because something else more important right now uh, needs to be done, you know. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, and that could be anything from we've got a combat operation going on or I've got to, that I've got a plan for or uh, this is happening or, uh, you know, children are suddenly arising, arriving in boats because wounded and bleeding because they were, you know, their school was, was bombed by the Viet Cong or... Uh, I mean, a thousand things are happening in reality right there where you are, and somebody in Saigon has this paperwork they want done. Well, I mean, please, you know, if it gets done, it's going to be a, a quick check. And uh, so they would have questions like, how many television antennas are in uh, the village? Now, this is sent to the whole country for a reasonable reason. Television antennas are a quick and easy assay for prosperity. Is there electricity provided in the village? And is there even a television station within their range? Are they getting information? How, how much information is arriving in this village uh, through television airways? They're, they're all reasonable pieces. I mean, it's, it's how intelligence is gathered in any place in the world. Believe me, during the Cold War, there were people driving through Czechoslovakia saying, how many television antennas are here, you know, for a reasonable reason. But I'm going to go out and count at television antennas you know, in a hamlet that is five, two or three hours away polling by, you know, a sandpan? It ain't, no, not going to happen. I might ask somebody, are there any televisions in that village? Uh, because I don't think so, you know, and I'll be willing to hazard a zero guess on that, even if I'm wrong. Uh, and, you know, so those evaluations, when put down on a person, you know, in my situation, yeah, give me a fully staffed district team, you know, uh, with the capabilities and the transport to do what I'm supposed to do, then great. But this is like I was talking about before, where you're working with, you know, half the number of troops or half the train, the half of what you need to do the job. But this is why armed services jobs are challenging beyond what most of the world recognizes because the responsibilities you put on 23, 24-year-old young army officers or young army NCOs uh, would stagger the mind uh, if you were like the corporate officer of uh, Chick-fil-A and, and were looking, what can I get out of my 20-year-old office manager? Uh, uh, I mean, it's just not comparable because uh, the, the things you are, that are demanded of you or can be, can be demanded of you and, and young men and women meet it every day. And uh, we don't see that in, in our society here. Um, as a district senior advisor, Again, I was 22 or 3 years old, 23 years old, 24 years old. I was responsible for all American military actions that would take place in my district. No one could fire a shot, drop a bomb, shoot a rocket without my permission. The, 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 in theory, the general uh, in charge of the 9th Infantry could not operate in my district unless I said he could because I was the advisor to the district chief and the district chief was the local national commander. You had to have the local national approval. Now, he would get his orders that said when the Americans want to, 
to operate, you say yes, and he would tell me yes. And of course, I mean, I would certainly hope not to be in the position of go, no, I'm just a lieutenant general, but uh, you, you can't do this. I don't think so. I don't think I, would, I wouldn't want that. But in theory, uh, and, and therefore, like the Navy had uh, the USS Benoit out in the Mekong River. That was the home ship for uh, uh, the PBRs, the river patrol boats that did patrolling up and down the Mekong and up and down the canals and did their sort of brown water warfare. And uh, the PBR would uh, come up our main canal to our place and help us transport troops, you know, and uh, they had more firepower on a PBR than I could get in an infantry platoon. I mean, they had multiple machine guns and mortars and all kinds of stuff. And so they would sit back in the canal. We could sit up and set up an ambush out there. And uh, if we got in a contact, I mean, we had instant firepower, you know, but they could not independently go set up unless I said they could. And, uh, and we had a, Granted, I gave I gave a blanket, well, a sort of blanket uh, approval, uh, areas where they could go and where they wanted to go and, and set up, uh, and and run their operations. But, you know, when it came for bombing along the border, uh, I was uh, on one occasion. I got into one of these international things. Again, out there, on, I was here. I was out there in this little mud fort, and we got a night reconnaissance call from a reconnaissance aircraft going over. And he says, "I see." Um, this was during a truce period. This was, if I recall correctly, during a truce period. That may be wrong. In in, in any case, got a call that he saw night movement of a long convoy of what he thought was boats. This was during the wet season, I know that. Coming toward us across from the border, that sanctuary area, and it seemed to be headed toward us. And so I said, well, can you get any, any help? And, uh, and uh, he says, this was an Air Force guy, he says, well, I've got an art light mission, which is B-52s, <laughs> going up north that I can call off from that, and we can call in a B-52 strike if you want to. I said, oh, do it. <laughs> and he said, well, he comes back. Now I forget who I'm talking to, whether it was the original. I'm sure that what must have happened was the original recon guy came and made the report. He contacted the Air Force, I assume, FAC, Forward Air Controller. The Air Force FAC who came in in another plane, and now he's going to be the guy talking to the B-52s. And the recon guy, I assume, went on to on his recon way. Uh, and for a long time, my memory was that I was talking to the B-52 pilot, but I was probably talking to the FAC, I don't know. But it turns out when I said, okay, well, if you can bring in the B-52s, do it, because there's only me and my five guys sitting here, and if this is that, there was a, intelligence said that there was a uh, NVA regiment across in that sanctuary area. And I said, we've got to take care of them. And they said, uh, you, we can't use the B-52s along the border without the uh, name and identification of the local American authority giving this permission. Well, I'm not going you don't give your name, rank, and serial number in the open over a, over a, a net like that. And I said, I can't uh, give you my name and rank, and I can give you my code name, and you can look it up, you know. And, and uh, they said, no, he's got to have it, you know, or he can't do it. 
and, uh, and it had to do with bombing along the border because this was not, we were not bombing. I think those B-52s actually weren't supposed to be there, you see. And, and so the fact they were dropping them on, on our side of the border or the other side of the border didn't matter. They weren't supposed to be there. And so, uh, but I, my recollection is that I, I finally, I said, okay. And with great trepidation, I gave my, you know, name, rank, whatever they asked for. Uh, and then they dropped them, and believe you me, that was one, even being several kilometers uh, away from that B-52 strike, that is one of the most awesome, terrible things. Uh, just, the, the, you know, the horizon just lit up like the biggest, baddest thunderstorm you ever saw in your life. And the thunder rolled uh, and the earth shook. It was like an earth, just constant, didn't let up. And shaking, and I've, I've said before, you could almost hear, feel the earth groan because it was just such an amount of energy and impact and uh, just blowing through there. And, you know, you never heard the B-52s. Of course, you never saw them. It was at night. Uh, the next day we were went out there, and it was like, I said, it was like um, somebody made a huge tossed salad. You know, it was just a vast expanse of, chopped up vegetation, you know, that just went on. You couldn't tell if you landed right on the middle of whatever it was that was there, it would have just been blown to pieces. You didn't uh, find hardly anything. There might have been a stick or two that you thought was a part of a sand pan or something, but it was, it was uh, being under, even closely under uh, a B-52 strike was... Uh, an awesome, awful thing. I, I, that was a, even, even it was my guys doing something for me. It was, it was just a, such a destructive force that it, it just was sobering. I'll put it that way. It was a sobering experience. Um, But most of our operations were very sort of light infantry, small unit kind of operations. You know, uh, squad to, I think on one occasion, we had like a battalion size operation where I, we had about 12 or so platoons. Each, each village or each hamlet had its... Uh, platoon, uh, this RF platoon, I mean it's RF company or it's PF platoon. And we had a combination of a couple of RF, comp uh, an, an RF company and a 10 or 12 RF platoons on a, you know, big operation with multiple arms and moving, trying to trap, you know. And, and sometimes we had similar things where platoons from an adjacent district you know, we would coordinate together and have larger operations. But, and we had air mobile operations, air assaults, you know, which is always a, a chilling thing as, as well uh, because those in the American units, I never went on an air assault with an American unit, but I know in our training for air assault, you could get about five Americans or six or seven, I forget, not, not even a whole squad on one helicopter. But on these helicopters with these smaller Vietnamese men and not carrying all the combat gear that Americans carry, they would just pack them in, you know. And I don't know, we could get 10 guys in a helicopter, I think, with a basic load of ammo, you know, and, a, and, a, and an M16. And because I was the advisor, having to see that checking that all things were going right on the ground, I would be the, I and my other teammate uh, who would be on another chopper, we would be the last ones on, which meant 
that you got to stand on the skids and kind of lean in the in the door and not even get in the helicopter and do the air assault practically hanging to the outside and there was always the threat that the Viet Cong, you know, had a plant in your squad or in your unit, you know, and that they might uh, and even likely did, you know, have infiltrators in your unit. So all you needed was a little kick in the butt from the wrong guy, even by accident, to send you out into the wild blue yonder. So air assaults were always a, uh, a matter of trepidation, and as you're landing, in them, uh, you know, you never know the water is spurting up everywhere or, or if it's wet season or uh, if there's a little water in the, around or dust, you know, is kicking up. And you never know if it's the rounds from your own support choppers that are shooting up the place or if it's you being shot at by, by others, you know. Uh, it's always, that was always a a thrill I could do without, but uh, you had air assault, so that would be like the most modern, advanced infantry warfare, air assaults. On the other hand, during the wet season, the only way you could move about, there were no roads, there was one road in my district. Well, actually there were two roads. One, there was Highway 30 that went along the Mekong River all the way from the Cambodian border to the ocean, I guess, or to down to Sadek or, or some big city uh, further in, uh, away. But uh, in my district, which was kind of a, you could imagine it as a rectangle with uh, one uh, of the small ends on the Mekong River and then uh, it running about 15 or 20 miles, I guess, uh, away in, in, a, in a long rectangle. And um, I forgot why I was telling you. You said you had one road in your district. Oh, yes. And there, were, there was only one road that, that went, didn't even go all the way through my district the long way. It just came to my village and stopped there. And so uh, anywhere else you went ever was by the canal on boats, even in the dry season. You, had to, you might have a motorized one. But most people just had a, you'd pole this little uh, two or three man sampans along. Um, but on sampan operations, they were all poled because you were going to go slow you, and you were going to be going in areas where you, your motor wouldn't work because you were, in, you know, it's in the flood season. So you were anywhere from just a few inches to over your head uh, in water. Our mean elevation was. Uh, I think about two meters above sea level, so uh, it was you know six feet basically, and uh, I have helicopter images from a helicopter that shows you the whole world is underwater. You know, all you see is the tops of tall grass and trees uh, for all the way to the horizon. You know. And the way you move around was on poling on sandpans. Well, you'd take your platoon, two or three men to boat and go poling back into these areas. Uh, and you had to figure out, you know, what's the mode of attack here? You know, you, you get schooling on ground formations, you know, and how to attack frontally or movements in columns, you know, oblique attacks, uh, dispersions under this way and that way and uh, lines of departure and et cetera, et cetera. But there's nothing about sampan operations, you know, and uh, so you were, you know, poling along <laughs> uh, across the plain of reeds, you know, looking for the Viet Cong. Uh, so you had all kinds and, and anything from like these four or five man night ambushes to battalion size operations, all kinds of things, uh, you know, that, that you were doing. And I was a district senior advisor, which was, a, I think, a, a, I don't know if it was unique, but unusual experience for someone in my 
of my rank and, and age and a, a bit of a disadvantage because I was so young. They, they venerate age. And so for me to be a district senior advisor as only a lieutenant meant that my district chief uh, could question, found it easy to question, you know, what oomph do you have, you know, in getting what we need done? You know, uh, do you have the province senior advisor's ear uh, or do you not, you know? My district chief next door, you know, told his senior advisor, who's a major or even a captain, that he wanted to do this or that and the other, and it got it done. But you're just a lieutenant. Can can you get it done? And uh, there was always that kind of kind of challenge that I had to sort of, you know, try to prove myself to to him as well. And um, I'm sure I didn't do it to his satisfaction many, many times, but I also had a district chief who, <clears throat> my original district chief was a Wahau. A Wahau is a brand of Buddhism popular in the Delta. They, the Wahau, were in rebellion against the Saigon government in the 40s and 50s and into the early 60s, but were also, during the early 50s, became very anti-communist, anti-Viet Minh, then anti-Viet Cong, because the Viet Minh, communist uh, Viet Minh, um, not all Viet Minh were communist, I'm not saying that, but a communist uh, version of the Viet Minh, um, Execute, assassinated the Wahau leader down in the Delta. And that turned the Wahau against the, what became the Viet Cong. So they were good fighters against the Viet Cong, but they were also good fighters against Saigon, which put them in an unhappy way relative to Saigon. And, um, and they continued, the, the Wahau continued to resent the Saigon government uh, as I learned to do as well, because once they worked out a peace when President Jim was in power, uh, they, they worked out a peace, and then the Wahau felt then uh, that Wahau, the Wahau units, it was agreed the Wahau units would be incorporated into the Arvin, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam the regular Vietnamese army. But then the Wahau felt that their Wahau units were then, since they were now in the Arvin, were used just like any other Arvin unit and sent up north as cannon fodder up north when their expectation was that those Arvin units, those Wahau Arvin units would be left in the Delta to protect the Delta. And so when I got there, the Wahau uh, were not all that happy with Saigon. They were definitely not happy with Hanoi. Uh, so it, there was some sort of a sense of like us against the world with, with them. Um, I guess that was kind of a background feeling at the point. I mean, nobody came up and like told me that. It was just something that a sensation I developed over, over time. But my original chief was a Wahau district chief. And as far as I knew, from what I could tell, he got along well, he was a good guy, we were off, and he was aggressive in his combat. He knew the area. And about halfway through, he would, and some other locals were really upset because he got bumped for a new, district chief who was coming out of Saigon, had never lived out of Saigon, had uh, been in the army since the 50s, but was part of the Saigon um, sort of headquarters scene. He was sort of a 
functionary staff officer, always had been, uh, had never, never lived without electricity um, and uh, running water, you know. Uh, but his family had gotten caught in a something in Saigon that the government didn't like, and they were all being punished. And his punishment was to be sent out to uh, out into exile <laughs> with with us folks, and uh, and so he appeared. He was in more culture shock, I think, than I was when I got there. Uh, his wife definitely was. She was terribly distraught because um, they were basically having to live in a grass shack with everybody else, and. Um, I guess he probably got a little upgrade into some wood building with a tin roof, but still no running water, no electricity. <clears throat> and he was a Catholic in a, well, this, this Trom Chim was originally what was called in the 50s an agroville, developed by, in the Jim regime, to get some of the northern, largely Catholic populations resettled. They had left North Vietnam, afraid of the Viet Cong. They, uh, large, thousands and thousands of North Vietnamese had come to the south. And to get them out of Saigon and to populate the unpopulated areas, they made these agrovilles. And um, Tram Chim was an agroville and, uh, originally. And it had a Catholic church, Catholic priest, uh, Catholic school, um, but it was in an area that was largely Wahau Pro uh, Protestant, Wahau Buddhist. And um, how well did the Catholic and Buddhist Vietnamese get along? Out where we were, as far as I knew, they uh, got along uh, fine, though. I think there was always some level of, uh, probably thin level of resentment as far as I knew out where we were because the Catholic priest kind of ruled the roost. Uh, apparently he was connected also in Saigon somehow and uh, because the original people that settled the, the town were kind of his people, you know, they were all Catholic. It was kind of understandable, but now it had grown larger. <clears throat> it was now a district town. It was more should be the government, not the Catholic Church. He was still kind of wanting to rule, you know, so he was a bit at polite odds with the, the district chief, the original one, the Wahal one little better shape with the, the Catholic one that came later, but the Catholic one was more at odds with the broader culture. He, fishermen and farmers, uh, I knew more about than he did, you know, and the warfare and counterinsurgency, I felt like I knew more than, than he did, not more than the first one, but more than he did because he had never been, he was a paper pusher back from Saigon, had been for 20 years. Um, and so uh, he, he was just a fish out of water uh, there and it was very difficult dealing with him. He wanted to take no responsibility so that I became the district chief. You know, I became the guy in charge of everything because whatever I said, when I would ask him, what do you want to do? You can, can, can these guys uh, can we have an artillery strike over here, you know, in this area? Or can we bomb here? Can we, he was all, whatever you, you don't, you see it, you do it. And so after a while, you just quit calling and say, yeah, okay. And, uh, and you become the guy in charge, you know, several, 10, 15,000 people over a size of Colquitt County and you run the show. And you're, you're 20. 23 years old, 24 years old. Um, up and down all night and all day, it, was, it just sucked the blood out of you. But you did the best you can, you know. And uh, and your guys sticking with you too, you know. They were they were under the same under the same pressures and the same same gun. Um, 
you see things, uh, oh, just terrible things with children that get, you know, like the bl blown up at, at a school. You got a medic with a couple of bottles of saline, some uh, APCs, which are uh, used to be the universal tablet for the army. Uh, they don't. I think they're illegal now because you can't combine the drugs or compounds for some reason. It was, I think it's acetaminophen, APC, acetaminophen, phenylephrine, and caffeine. And it was kind of like a super aspirin was basically what it was, you know. And the APCs, you would have a jar, the medic had a jar of APCs. Whatever was wrong with you, you got an APC. And, uh, and a couple of bottles of saline uh, to hang in case you were wounded, you know, and, and needed uh, some transfusion uh, or infusion before a chopper could get out. American units were told you could, uh, you got wounded in country, you'd have a, a chopper within 30 minutes anywhere in country. That's what I was told in infantry school. Well, we were off the American system. We were with the Vietnamese. Uh, Vietnamese got air support, American air support, only if other American units were not requiring air support. So if we called a chopper for a chopper for medical evac, that happened if no other unit, American units need air evac. Now, it is true, I'm sure, I hope it's true, I, I believed, always believed it was true, that if you said, I've got an American, advice, an American down, you hoped they would jump the system somehow, but the rule was, you got what the Vietnamese got, you know, and the Vietnamese, uh, and so, you know, uh, you didn't necessarily get a 30-minute chopper, uh, you know, or a 10-minute or a 5-minute chopper. Um, the one time that, well, the one time I had an American that had to be lifted, well, I can't say. I don't know. It seemed like forever, but probably wasn't. I don't know. Uh, the the Vietnamese, we had Vietnamese wounded, then first of all, it'd be they'd call for Vietnamese air support. If they couldn't get it, then they would call to see if, it, then it would be on me to try to call an American unit to see if we could get some support. And that was where the, well, we will come help you if no Americans are needed. No, no Americans need it, need it. And uh, well, you know, that was the way it worked. And from the American perspective, I, I understand that, but still, there we were, came hanging out on the end of the thread. Um, but, I mean, you know, we knew that, uh, and I understood it as an operational thing. That's the way you, you have to do it. So that's just the way it was. Um, and uh, the Viet we saw, oh, the other thing was, though, I was starting talking about the medical stuff. You couldn't get medical support like you could if you were in an army unit or if you were in an American city. They had what they called medical clinics, but they had a, at best, they had a nurse or a midwife, at best, and, or maybe even like a nurse, uh, uh, we would call maybe a license, an LPN, a licensed practical nurse, you know, just somebody who had some very basic sort of first aid skills or could take a temperature reading, you know, uh, maybe give you a, some aspirin or something like that or an injection, um, but not, not much there uh, with regard to supply or even personnel, if you even had that. Um, so if someone really got injured, they would bring them to us at our compound because they would hope we could get a medevac for them. And sometimes you couldn't. And even if you could medevac them, they would take them back to uh, the Vietnamese hospital or even to an American hospital. These people had no money. How were they going to ever get back home? There was no re return service, you know. They would be put out of the hospital on the street and say, 
I, no, we can't get you back. We don't have a helicopter to get you back or anything. Uh, so children coming in uh, hurt was just terrible that you couldn't, you know, picking shrapnel out of them. Uh, and the, it was almost more terrible because they would not cry. They would be absolutely silent and you would be doing the most ghastly thing to them where they'd have holes blown in them and things. And, and you'd be waiting on a chopper, you know, trying to, to get them some help and you'd be wounding, patching, working with your medic to do whatever you, you could. Um, and uh, their mothers, of course, were usually doing more wailing than, than they were. And um, just, just terrible, terrible things. And, and children, babies, infants brought in with like skin. And there were, because there was no running water, there was no public sanitation. So uh, all of your uh, uh, body waste products were just right into the water in the canal, which was... You're, you're, you were upstream of the village next door uh, or uh, into, they would dig these holes and have a, like a little treen, little uh, palm thatch, waist high latrine that you could walk out onto a pole. And you'd have to learn, we call them monkey bridges because it was like one pole, and they learned all their lives you could walk that pole out across. Sometimes the bridge would be across a canal. That's how you got on the other side of the canal. But it would just be one pole. And there may be a little thin, thin, thin support pole, but you weren't, it was more for confidence than for support because if you really leaned on it, it would just fall in. But they would, you would go out there and you would just squat on this little, over, over this hole that was dug, that in the flood, would fill up with water. And then when the floods next year went down, fish seeking deep water would go in there and finally they couldn't get out anymore. So that became an instant fishing hole where you got all the fish out. And then you went and <laughs> crapped in it again. <laughs> anyway, skin diseases and fungal infections of all kinds and, and ringworm. Children dying of ringworm because they were so infested and dehydrated and irritated and then in secondarily infected from the scratching and everything uh, that you, you go, this, is, this can't be possible, but it is possible. And it happens all around the world that we don't see here, but I've seen it and other people, many other people, I'm sure, uh, that work in those areas have seen this kind of kind of thing, uh, where the basic rudimentary things that we just expect every day are not there, and you would see this and know there's nothing I can do about this. And the mother would bring them back the next day. You would do something, give them some little trop topical cream, or or do something for immediate uh, a little relief, but. Nothing you knew you could really do. More than once, because there was no electricity, uh, light in the evenings at night was by kerosene lantern or a little kerosene flame. The houses were largely bamboo thatch, catches fire very easily. And multiple, more than once, uh, children and adults Badly burned, come in, nothing you could do. Uh, you know, if, I mean, if somebody's arm from here down is third degree burn, uh, you could try to get them a helicopter. You probably couldn't get a helicopter for that because they would say, well, you know, it's a day's ride into the nearest hospital, but you're not going to, that, that person is not going to die before they get there, so they could go you know, catch a boat or a taxi and, and come and they're not going to send a helicopter, you know, a hundred thousand dollar helicopter ride uh, for, for that. Uh, yet, if they went in and even got that first salve or wrapping, two days later they come back 
wanting your medic to take that gauze off and treat it. We had nothing to treat it with. Uh, I remember a girl whose whole leg was a third degree burn and we had to wrap it in uh, gauze and every couple of days her mother would bring her back and we, all we could do is pour hydrogen peroxide on it. It went over. And that girl would sit there and never make a sound and we would peel that bandage off of that entire leg and then put it back again, knowing that this was going to do no good, uh, that surely she was going to die because of secondary infection in that environment. But there was no place for her to go. She got sicker and sicker and finally her mother did. I don't even know. I don't think, I think she was from a, uh, not from our immediate village, but from one down the canal. And she eventually didn't come back anymore. Dead girl. Terrible. And um, so you got, you know, you see that kind of experience. It just hangs with you. Uh, it's not just what war teaches you, but what poverty and uh, third worldness teaches you. That, uh, you know, you can say, yeah, it was a unique experience. Uh, that most people don't get, and that's true, but that makes life very frustrating because you can't describe that to everybody. You can't go around the rest of your life saying, oh, yes, but, you know, or I saw this, or you should have seen that, or you, we ought to do the other because, you know, 30 years ago in Vietnam, I did saw so-and-so or whatever. Everybody gets tired of that. And... Uh, so it's very difficult uh, to have a memory sometimes. But um, how have you how have you dealt with that with the memories? Well, I think a, a large help was writing the writing the book when I when I came back from Vietnam. My uh, first. I had a real difficult time for the first couple of months because suddenly I had nothing to do. I went from that experience to having nothing to do, waiting to go back into graduate school. I almost went crazy, just uh, doing nothing, you know. And uh, then I went back to graduate school. <clears throat> the news kept coming, you know. This, so now we're in the 1970. We're into the uh, Vietnamization, which started when I was there, and turning the war over to the Vietnamese, the U.S. coming out, and uh, the anti-war business continuing and intensifying even. And so what I was hearing about the war and what I was hearing from other Viet Vietnamese, uh, other Vietnam veterans, was not my experience, and I don't think, I did not think, took notice of my experience, which had been terribly impactful to me. And so I would go into my lab, the lab I was doing my graduate work in, in my office, in the early in the morning before anybody else got there, and I would just write, just write, uh, no stopping, no corrections, nothing about something that was on my mind, some incident or something. And I would put that aside and the next day I would come and it would be something else. And the next day something else. This went on, off and on for years. Uh, and um, sometime in the early, probably in about 1980 or 81 or so, I just had this huge stack of paper and had this idea that I thought of as incredible hubris that maybe you can make a book out of this, you know, and I thought, come on, you're not a writer, you, you, never, you know, you don't uh, know anything about that, and besides that, you've got a day job, you know, you, you've got to spend, you got to focus on that. 
But I just sort of kept up that same thing, except I became more intentional about it. I uh, would get up at five o'clock in the morning and write from reworking all that stuff uh, to make it, to clean it up, to make it better writing, to make it more in a narrative form so that hopefully what kind of one thing reasonably bled into the next, into the next, uh, through, uh, you know, throughout the experience. And that took several years because it was in the morning. And then after the kids were put to bed at nine o'clock at night, I would write from nine to 11 again. And um, that went on until about 83. And I said, okay, I thought I had it. I said, okay, now you've got a manuscript. I had told nobody about this. I was doing this all completely in the basement of my house, except my wife knew about it, but that was it. And I said, now what? I didn't dare tell anybody because I thought, you know, how foolish, you know, this all is. There's no way you're really going to make a book out of this. And uh, but I said, okay, well, you got the manuscript. Now what? I had no idea. And um, I, excuse me, it, uh, Susan is talking on the phone. Should I stop that or is that at a level that? I think we'll be okay. Okay. Uh, well, let me know. <laughs> let me know if she can get loud. Uh, Oh, and so uh, I said, uh, you know, now what do I do? The only thing, the only person I knew who I thought might know anything about publishing was the publisher of our local newspaper whose son was in my um, Boy Scout troop. And I knew him through that. And I, the only reason I thought he might know something about publishing or book publishing was because we were living in Charlottesville, Virginia at the time, and there were enough uh, local authors that every now and then the local newspaper there would be a piece about them you know and they would talk about their work and their books and things and I mean, maybe he knows something or somebody it turned out that he was writing a book with someone else who was already a published author they had an agent already and i had written a couple of years before georgia tech had joined the acc and I, being from Georgia and the University of Georgia, was being very snide about Georgia Tech being sort of wimpy and joining the ACC instead of the SEC, you know, where the big boys play football, you know, anyway. Like that was my, I was making a joke out of it. I fully respect Georgia Tech as an academic institution. Uh, but... Uh, I, I wrote this kind of tongue-in-cheek, sarcastic letter to the editor, just my, kind of making fun of it, which I, at that time, and uh, I don't think I'd ever written a letter to the editor in my life, but I just did it on a whim. And he remembered that, and he said, well, I know at least at a certain level you can write, so I will recommend that the agent take a look at your manuscript which the agent did. And the, then he got back to me and he said, I think you've got something here, but I think you've got about another year of rewriting to do this and this and this and this. I, I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I did that. And about another year, I sent it to him. And like right off the bat, McGraw-Hill took it. And uh, it was very well regarded, very well, very well reviewed, and uh, got in all the big review things, and and uh, so that that helped, that helped. But you know, once that kind of was over, you know, it's still. I mean, because the war kept coming back. You know, I mean, uh, it kind of never went. A, way, I mean, it be began to decline in the national consciousness, but it was always coming up as a negative, you know, uh, as when, when mentioned at all, it was always an, uh, in, in the negative sense. I didn't belong to any American uh, vet organization, any ordinary veterans organizations, 
because I largely I think because of what we talked about before. Um, but uh, so it was still always on your mind. I think other than that, though, you just kind of sucked it up, you know, and kept it to yourself. Uh, if somebody would ask you about it, you would tell them at the level you thought they were really interested, which was usually pretty thin, <laughs> and, you know. And uh, if you talked to another veteran, if you started talking about it, and back now when I was at the University of Virginia, there were like no veterans that I knew, you know. Call it university faculty are not veterans by and large, you know, especially not combat veterans. Uh, I had a strange experience with one. He was in the he was uh, in the architecture school, and I don't know how we met. I think it had to do with he was doing some architecture work for a building the university was at the medical school, and I was on the committee for that, and somehow we met in that, and and then. He somehow learned I was a Vietnam veteran. He said he was, and he was in the 101st Airborne. And, uh, and this was just before the first Gulf War. So this was in like late 80s. And that first Gulf War started on whatever date it was, the, the what do they call it, the, anyway, the storm and thunder bombing thing, you know, where they really hit Baghdad hard with the bombing and all the troops went. And it was, they put up TV screens in the hospital cafeteria, you know, everybody was watching it and, and everything. And I get this call, I was in my, and I get this call, it's from this architect. He said, you see the news? And I said, yes. And he said, what are you thinking? And the short answer, the short story is, we were both Vietnam veterans. We were veterans of, of, at that point, our last war. This was the first one that had come up big time since then, not that trivial stuff about uh, Panama or uh, that whatever, another Caribbean island thing that was over in 10 minutes or something. Uh, but it, it, we both had the same reaction, which was, strangely enough, it doesn't feel right that we're not there, that we are the combat experienced ones. All these young guys, completely new generation of soldiers, are jumping into this thing. They don't know what they're doing. They can't know what they're doing. You know, we had this kind of insane sense that we uh, old guys, we were, you know, like 60 or something at the time, you know, but that, you know, you know, this is, this is not fun. You know, these guys need all the help they can get, you know, and it, it was kind of an empty feeling. It was like discordant somehow that you were more than just an observer, but you were not a participant. That was very strange, but it was, he called me because that was his feeling and it was exactly my feeling. And so I, I imagine it, that was true across for a, a lot of people. But, you know, I guess, you know, that was kind of in the answer to how you dealt with it. I guess, you know, around, around other veterans, you, you, you maybe deal with it in, in different ways. I know now, locally here, a number of my friends, uh, two bank presidents, the mayor, uh, 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 pa both pastors, bat pastors of both the biggest uh, churches in, in town, uh, you know, I mean, prominent people that are in charge of doing things or Vietnam veterans, you know, at a university, that does not happen. That does not happen. And so when, when we are together, it's very common that the war comes up and they talk about, we talk about our experiences. And they were all conventional, our Navy guy and Air Force guy, 
uh, uh, Army Signal Corps guy. You know, I was an Army Infantry guy, an Air, another Air Force guy who flew caribous in and out of the little strips like I had near me, you know. And uh, there's always something, even though they were in the American Army, there's always things you can have in common and commiserate about without going into, you guys had a different war than I did, you know, kind of thing. But, um, you know, we ha had that uh, experience for almost a year, and I was out on a combat operation one day, and I had on, I remember jungle, you'll see why I remember this, uh, it was still the water, the wet season was going down, but it was real muddy and boots packed in mud, uh, tiger stripe fatigue uniform, blue beret, combat harness and gear. And I get a call that says, uh, a helicopter is coming for you. And uh, I really on camera. So one day <clears throat> I was out on an operation. <clears throat> And um, I remember, for a reason you'll see in a minute, I remember the, what I had on, I, uh, combat boots, a tiger fatigue uh, uniform, which was not an, uh, an American uniform, with uh, you know my blue Vietnamese uh, beret, but my combat harness and ammo and weapons and all that stuff. And we were in the middle of an operation. Uh, it, as I call it, it might have been uh, even an, uh, an air, Helleborn, air mobile assault that day. But for whatever reason, apparently a helicopter was available because I got this call on the radio that said a helicopter was coming for me, which was very unusual. And I said, I, I think I asked what, what's going on, or I, I feared that something had gone wrong somewhere in the operation and that some kind of major adjustment was going to have to be made. And they said me, not, not my uh, uh, counterpart, Vietnamese counterpart, or the troops are coming, everybody's coming, they said, they're coming to get you. And I said, I asked what for, and they would not say, as I recall. Uh, I don't know if I was under the impression that it was classified or, or they only gave me marginal information. I, I wasn't clear what the deal was, but I knew it was something up. And so the helicopter came, and I, I, I felt very badly because I couldn't explain to um, my, my counterpart and the troops that were there with us. Because one of the things you really didn't like to do was to be treated separately as an American from the others. For them to have to go out walking but you ride. Or them being out there and having to walk back but you get a helicopter. You know, that, that was bad. And uh, I couldn't explain to him. I just, I don't know. They're they say they're coming to get me. And I could imagine that him going, yeah, right. You know, you're just squeezing out on us here and leaving us alone, you know. Um, but they, when the helicopter took me back and my teammates were all there at the, well, not all of them, because that left my other teammate out there by himself. I didn't like that either. But, but the three remaining teammates were, uh, came out to the helipad, which was outside our little triangular fort, and they had my duffel bag uh, with them packed, crammed full, and uh, a message that the chopper pilot had earlier given them when he had, he had come there originally and given them. It was a Red Cross message 
uh, saying that my father had had a heart attack and was, as I recall, or somehow I got the impression that he was unlikely to survive and that I uh, had a Red Cross leave. Again, I, my recollection is that Red Cross leaves you, you take the option for or, or not. They don't force you to take it. But I said, oh, okay, my dad is dead or dying, uh, I'll go. But I felt really badly about it at the same time because I was leaving my guys there. Those guys were the only Americans you knew for miles and miles around. And they had your back all the time. You had their back. You were two by two going out on operations all the time. Uh, and so sort of in a sense, uh, a little before my ordinary time of going back, I was leaving just like that. There was no, you know, goodbye or, uh, you know, you're getting short. Vietnamese word for first lieutenant is Trung Nguy, and everybody would call, they would call you Trung Nguy, and you, you know, you're... There's no period of adjustment down. You get a replacement in, you know, and all that. It was just, I was out on an operation fighting the Viet Cong, and all of a sudden, I was flying home. What's that? Whoa. You know, and we just whipsawed around. And uh, when I got, I got back to my province team, and they basically handed me my medical record that they had there in the medic shed and said, uh, you get a 30-day Red Cross leave, but there, you're going to have some time on the end of that, so you'll have to come back. So keep your gear. Don't turn it in. Okay, so I had my jungle fatigues, my combat harness, my... Um, uh, you know, weapon, helmet, all that stuff, uh, jammed into this duffel bag. And then I got, I guess, same, same chopper, I guess, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, immediately went to Saigon, to Tonsonut Air Base, to what was called Camp Alpha, where people from the, everybody, many people in the southern part of Vietnam flew in and out of there out processing, in, in processing and out processing. And so I went to whatever building they pointed me to and kind of got papers stamped and uh, got a ticket and never got a change of clothes. Uh, I, I turned in my M16 and a basic load of ammunition. That was a very strange thing. When you got into Vietnam, you were issued a lot of stuff, but amongst that was one M16 and a basic load of ammo, which is six loaded clips in a little cloth uh, bandolier. And what you had to turn in at the very last in Saigon was your M16 and a basic load of ammo. I don't know why you had to turn in a basic load of ammo, the M16, I got to understand, but you did. So I walked over to the terminal to await my aircraft home, and I was saying, this is when you're starting thinking, okay, my plane is, leaves in two hours, and uh, this is when they're going to attack the airfield, and the mortars and the artillery is going to start falling on me, and I'm going to get blown up in the very last minute. Uh, and you sort of sit there hunkered in a corner, you know, the whole time. <clears throat> I was waiting, and at some point, I got, I, maybe I was putting something into or whatever, I, I opened my duffel bag, or I, t I hit my duffel bag, and I heard it go ka-clunk, something metal in there. They were really big on people not bringing unauthorized weapons, fully automatic weapons, ammunition, any of that kind of stuff back to the States. I said, what, what is that? Well, my teammates had known about the basic load of ammo turn in, 
And so they provided me one in my duffel bag but never told me about it. And now I'm sitting there within sight of the MPs who are running the line checking for this stuff where you have to open your duffel bag and all that. And uh, I'm now also still dressed in the combat outfit that I had on. You're not supposed to go back to the States, you know, unless you're in your, uh, what were they, I guess, Class B, you know, khakis, short sleeve khakis. And, uh, but I had the ticket, I was there, I had no other uniform that I could change into. Uh, it turned out I did, but uh, more on that later. Uh, so I was in this weird uniform and I, I thought this MP is going to, you know, he's a special spec for MP, he's going to see this lieutenant, he's going to have it right over him, he's going to just hammer me down. Uh, but I said, I, I don't want to go through the line with it in there, so I, I'm going to take these six loaded magazines of ammo to the MP and just tell him, explain and hope he believes me. I was very embarrassed, but he, he believed me, kind of skeptical, gave me the hairy eyeball, but he said, okay. And uh, so we, you know, got on the plane, came home, everybody cheered when the wheels went up off the uh, runway. That was, that was a great feeling. And we got, uh, came back to the States. I was still in uh, the uniform I'd been in the field with now, I guess the day before, or maybe pushing two days before. No shave, no shower, no nothing. And uh, we came back into Oakland Air Terminal. Uh, it was at night, came off the plane. We, I don't know, some little piddling thing we had to do there. And there was a bus to take you to uh, the San Francisco commercial terminal, terminal for you to fly home. Back in those days, all the major air terminals had MPs cruising them because of soldiers coming and going a lot. And uh, when I got there, still in my fatigue uniforms, no shower, no shave, uh, uh, and I have a ticket to Atlanta and, and from Atlanta down to Moultrie, which had an airport at the time, a commercial airport. And the MP comes up to me and says, you cannot fly in the United States in that uniform. You have to fly in khakis or class A's, the green, at the time, the green uniform. Well, at the very bottom of my duffel bag was the khaki uniform that I had flown into country with the, a year or almost a year earlier. It had been at the bottom of that duffel bag for most of the year in a Connex container. So I, I went in the men's room of the San Francisco airport, pulled everything, all my combat harness helmets <laughs> and all this stuff and what other, I don't know what all got thrown in there in it, and at the very bottom was my low quarters, which are the black Oxford uh, uniform, uh, shoes, covered in green mildew, and my uniform, which was just squished and crushed. As an infantry officer, you pride yourself on being what they used to call strack. I don't even know what that stood for, stands for, but strack meant that your creases were crisp, your uniform was proper, your brass was bright, that you were sharp, you know? Uh, and I was just, I said, I cannot, you know, and the, and the brass was kind of green as well too. And, and all the other guys that were in uniform, I guess that back in the, over in Vietnam had had at least some capacity to have them pressed and cleaned, you know, and maybe a nine or two to polish their brass or something, I don't know. but. I dug that thing out, took a toilet tissue and wiped the shoes as well as I could. I put my brass on. Felt just terrible because I just looked so grungy and just, oh, terrible. And, uh, but I got on the plane, 
we were flying home. Uh, an old senior, he was like a master sergeant or something, army master sergeant, walks down the aisle, and, I guess to go to the bathroom. And that's why he comes back. He walks by me, kind of giving me the eyeball. I'm sitting on the aisle side. And uh, he walks by me. And then he comes back, he leans over and he says, excuse me, Lieutenant, but you have your brass on upside down. <laughs> I thought, oh, you, I didn't think I could get any lower. I didn't think I could get any worse, you know, but to have a senior NCO come in, excuse me, Lieutenant, but your brass is on upside down. I thought, oh, God, you know. And, uh, but anyway, I, I said, oh, excuse me, Jerry, I turned it around. But anyway, I got back to Atlanta, short sleeve. It was February and they were having an ice storm. And oh, it, it was just miserable gray and everything. But uh, I still hadn't shaved. And so I, the only time in my life I've ever done it, I went into a barber shop in the uh, airport there and I had a barber shop shave where they put the hot towel on your face and all that kind of thing. Um, I had a shave and then caught the, what at the time was Southern Airways uh, airplane uh, down to the Moultrie Airport. And my wife uh, and, and brother, my wife and brother met me there. But it was kind of in the Atlanta airport that I first noticed that uh, sort of separation between the returning soldier and the population around them, because it was like you weren't there. Nobody would look at you or uh, kind of avoid your eye or you weren't there. I mean, I don't know nobody said anything or, or that I remember or did anything in particular, but it was just like you weren't there. Whereas now when you see all the films of soldiers returning. Everybody flap them on, slap them on the back. You know, buy them a drink or, or say hello or or welcome home or something. You're nothing, just like you didn't exist. And uh, I got you know back to Moultrie and uh, went directly to the hospital and, and thankfully was able to see my father who. Uh, died soon after, but I was glad to be able to, to see him. Got to the end of my leave, and the last word I had heard was, they had told me I was coming back at my province, and they told me I was not coming back, I believe, in Saigon. Okay, fine. I never read my orders. Mistake number one. I did not read my orders. I got the orders a day or two, the, I think it was like the night before, they had, they had said, what you do when the end of your leave, you go to the nearest army post to you, where you are and check in at the headquarters building. They'll take it from there. I said, okay, fine, that's what I'll do. So I, it was like the night before, and I was to go to Fort Benning, it's the closest one. And it's only two, two and a half hours away. And so I'm packing up, I guess. I don't specifically remember this, but I assume it's something like I was packing up and I pull out my orders and I read my orders. And it says very clearly that on tomorrow, that next day, I was to appear at Oakland Air Terminal in San Francisco for return to Vietnam. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going, there's a, a, a military violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice called missing movement. It's not like desertion or something, but it's missing movement, especially to a combat area or something, you know. There's a penalty, <laughs> a big penalty for that. And I said, I'm going to miss movement. That's, I'm, I am in deep trouble. I don't think I slept a wink. I, Knew I couldn't get to San Francisco, so I, you know, drove to drove up to Fort Benning, checked myself in at a what they call Building One, the main headquarters building. I went to Building One, 
somehow somebody directed me to the to an office where a major was sitting in there, very friendly guy. He looked at my orders and I explained. I said, you know, they they said I didn't have to come back. I wouldn't be coming back. I've got all my gear. I, should, I, had, I had it with me. I wanted to show you. I've got all this gear. They wouldn't have given it to me, you know, otherwise. Kept, told me to keep it. And, uh, uh, oh, no, no. Well, that, that, had, that had been the original uh, story that, that I was going to be coming back. But I had, at the end, been told that I, I should report to, to Benning. And so I was trying to explain all this to him, and I, I was afraid that he was going to be just like, oh, you know, you know, you have screwed up big time. But rather than being unhelpful, as many people can be, he was very helpful, and he called the Pentagon and uh, explained it to them. And I guess because, you know, the war was winding down or, or whatever, uh, and they were used to people out processing or something. They said, uh, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, the, basically, the two weeks I would have had to have spent in Vietnam, that was the thing. It was stupid of them for me to go all the way back, you know, because about the time I hit there would have been the time they would have pulled you out of the field anyway to begin down processing you, out processing you, and giving you, uh, when you got a certain short, what they call going short, being short, a uh, short period of time left, they would pull you out of the field, just the idea that, okay, you made it this far, we'll try to get you to survive the last little bit. Uh, it made no real sense for me to go back. And they, under, they, they, they said, yeah, that's right. And so I spent two weeks at Fort Benning. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, just hang out get any medical care taken care of you want to, uh, but uh, be just, I forget who I was to report. Anyway, I didn't do any, I, for two weeks, I just went and got my teeth drilled, you know, done, any free government help I could get. And I, I my brother-in-law was uh, on uh, permanent party there at the infantry school. He was an armor officer teaching the part of the armor phase of what you teach infantry officers. And so I stayed with him and his wife for the two weeks, uh, two or three weeks, I forget, and out processed there at Benning to uh, come back to Moultrie, wait uh, over the summer to begin graduate school back at University of Georgia where I went and got my master's and my doctorate. Went after that for a period of postdoctorate training at the University of Texas Medical School at San Antonio. Got a job uh, in the urology department uh, at the University of Virginia and stayed there for 32 years or something. Uh, you know, uh, retired as a professor, and then the Board of Visitors, if you've been a nice guy, makes you a prefer professor emeritus, which I was, and uh, we stayed there for another few years. I, they let me, because I was emeritus, they let me keep my, you know, email and my office and phone and computer and all that stuff, and I stayed in, con you know, I could go in and kind of talk with my colleagues and do what I thought was interesting or fun relative to the work I had been doing before. And then my, when my mother and brother passed away in fairly short order uh, about five years ago, my wife and I, my wife who is also from Moultrie, uh, had a decision to make about whether to move home and look after our legacy family farm or to sell it and we decided not to sell it because for me anyway I didn't want to sell the last Turner property on Turner Road <laughs> uh, well, as long as I'm alive I, I wanted there to be a Turner on Turner Road so uh, 
you know, we, we decided to move back to Moultrie and we've been here since 2000. We moved in 2014. And you've got two children, correct? Yes, I have two children, uh, uh, adult, very adult children. Uh, a daughter, Heather, who is a nurse at the University of Virginia Medical School, still in Charlottesville, does a great job. She's a, a uh, unit coordinator, I guess you would call it, uh, who does the interface between the attending physicians and the nursing staff. Um, to make sure what the physician ordered is what the nursing staff does. And my son is uh, a, a teacher at a private school in, in Melbourne, Florida, where he teaches uh, science and engineering, does a great job um, dealing with kids in the high school age group for which I highly commend him. I'm not sure I would have the nerve for it. Uh, but uh, anyway, they're both doing very well. My uh, wife retired as a kindergarten teacher and uh, now uh, does some uh, volunteering here locally and is in, involved with a number of things, as I am. And, um, you know, life is good. How old was, your daughter was born right before you went to Virginia? Yes, yes, she was an Uncle Sam baby. She was intended to uh, be born uh, soon after I entered service. So the, my uh, taxes would, mine and your taxes would pay for that birth uh, while I was in the Army. And uh, so she was born in 68 and um, my son was born in 72. So we paced them just far enough apart so they would not both be in college at the same time. <laughs> that was very handy. Prior planning, financial planning has many aspects of financial planning. <laughs> so you were in Vietnam for just under a year, yes. correct? Yes. How was that coming back to Heather, who had not seen you? Oh, uh, she didn't. She didn't know me from Adam. I'm sure you know. But uh, we picked up with that. As far as I recall, any any problem? I guess she would have accepted any babysitter, <laughs> you know, who was there. And Susan had a job teaching, so it was uh, I who, you know, sat at home and fed her and changed the diapers and and did all that right off the bat and, and, and played with her. And then the rest of the time it was like, you know, sit there and watch television or something like that, uh, which was not easy to do, you know, uh, after that year of such intense activity. And a frustration of knowing that local people and people who knew me had no, no, idea what the experience was like and when it came to talking about Vietnam which was often in conversation had no idea what they were talking about but I thought it incorrectly I guess almost beneath my dignity to bother to tell them you know if they didn't know already you know I don't know it was an attitudinal thing on my part as well you know that that I was not going to explain 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 you know a way uh, you know um, because everybody had an attitude already and so I was just not going to deal with it was there curiosity even about Sometimes, no, but not much, frankly. Wow. There would be con some uh, con uh, question, curiosity about, well, what, you know, had you done kind of thing. But what they, their background was, you know, from what the, um, the exposure and what was going on with the American troops, that was all they knew. The, to sit, you know, with the complexities of explaining what I did for, like, we've been here for, I don't know, an, an hour or more. Uh, that's not what they were, you know, they wanted the, the sound bite on what you did, you know, and, okay, and then go on. That was my impression anyway. 
And uh, with few exceptions, uh, I think that was the case. And so, you know, most people I would give what I thought might be a satisfactory brief answer, but let it go at that. Is there a, is there a best memory of your time in Vietnam that you haven't shared yet? Mm. If not a best memory, maybe a most rewarding experience? Um, well, anytime you helped someone directly, you loaded a kid on a helicopter or an adult that they could have never gotten, you know, or um, I would have my uh, parents and relatives send anything they could get in a box that might be sent, you know, a toy or a, uh, rubber gloves for the uh, the health clinic, you know, aspirin. Any, you put, my mother-in-law was a nurse. My uncle was a vet. Uh, all my uh, aunts and other friends and stuff could put a toy airplane or a plastic horse or something, you know, in a box and say, and so you would you could give that a candy, you know, and stuff. Uh, I have a grainy, grainy, almost unintelligible picture that uh, one of my guys took and, and then years later gave to me, I think manufactured from a slide originally, of me handing out candy at Christmas uh, in the village street. You know, kids all around, you know, just handing out candy. I mean, doing that kind of... Uh, kind of work was was really really fun but I guess sort of one of the unique experiences that I thought I had that was pleasant was one time I had to go supposedly to look at a uh, once well, supposedly I was supposed to go to a hamlet that I had kind of off the beaten path and uh, inspect and maybe do an operation, as I recall, with their PF platoon. And it wasn't on one of the even the main canal or even one of the side canals. It was down a, a little uh, natural uh, creek or small river that ran down to the Mekong. And but off the beaten path, and it was all covered with kind of jungle and stuff all around it. And my, as I recall, my, I, it was one of those times where I couldn't, it didn't work out well for me to have a partner. So I went with my, one of my counterparts, Vietnamese counterparts, and one soldier who was doing the boating. Uh, and we, we actually rode down to where the, on the main canal to where the river crossed or came off uh, in a, I think a power motorized boat, but we, to go along the little river, we were poling along and we got off the main canal and where the, all the main villages and stuff were and the hamlet was some distance down. And I had not been down this creek before and a little bit I was leery because I didn't think there was any way anybody could know I was coming except, well, that PF platoon, I think they knew I was coming. I was a little concerned about an ambush in that kind of situation. And there were only like three of us, and we were all armed, but three of us in an open boat in the middle of a canal, that's not hard shooting. I mean, <laughs> easy to take out. So we were really watching ahead and movement, unusual, anything. And um, I was going along and I see up ahead, right in the curve of this building, an or for a kind of a derelict, and on one hand it was kind of old and faded, but on the other hand it was very ornate, small, temple-like thing. And we got there to it and that's what it was. It was a Buddhist, I, I, and I guess it was a Wahel Buddhist, but at least Buddhist, small temple 
that was on a sort of a deck or a platform looking over the water of this canal. And just so out of curiosity, I told us, I said, let's pull up there and look at it. And there were a couple of monks in it when they had some little yellow robe or thing and uh, saffron or a purpley thing too. And uh, there was, I think, some attendant buildings behind it, but what you could see as you approached was this facade that had, there was a platform that you got off, tied up the boat, you get off, and then this facade with these kind of ornate carved columns and the overhead thing was like a dragon-like thing with, that at one time it had been gilded, you know, but it was old and the paint, I guess, was red and green, faded, old wood. But inside, then when you walked inside, it was a temple and they had the little altar area and the joss sticks and it was very quiet, very serene, and these guys were keeping it. Now, I guess maybe with some others, I think there were some others out back, but they offered tea. And we sat there in this temple, this, this very ornate Asian, oriental looking uh, feeling temple looking out over this calm canal water with this kind of tropical vegetation going around, absolutely quiet, a bird or two, you know, and sipping tea with these two monks. And of course, you know, we're armed up and, and, uh, and uh, you know, were at one point ready, ready for anything that happened. But that was kind of a very different, pleasant, sort of national geographic moment, you know, that, that uh, you, you sat there and uh, trying to sit to tea with these monks, you know, in, in the middle of the Plain of Reeds, so to speak, just off the Mekong, not, not in the Plain of Reeds, really. But that was a very pleasant one uh, at uh, a more Mm, a somber one for me uh, was on, uh, during the Christmas truce. We uh, that I this that's something that sticks in my mind was at the Christmas truce. We could not have operations. We could not put out ambushes or you know have any offensive operations. But it was legit to put up your perimeter defenses and so we checked uh, after dark one of my guys and I harnessed up got our gear and we were going to check all the outposts around the village to make sure everybody was there everybody was armed up in case we got an attack because the Viet Cong were prone to do that kind of thing and we went around did it all Everything was fine. We had to put our combat harness, our ammo around our waist, uh, blue berets, M16s, bayonets, all this stuff. And uh, we were coming back down the village street, and there's no, no electricity, so all the light in the village, or either a lantern hanging by a, in, in a house, in a little... Uh, bamboo thatch hooch, we would call it, or house, or, um, or maybe a little candle light that would be on a table out by the side of the street where people tended to sit at the edge of the house or be, you know, up and down in the street. And that's the, all the light that's provided. Otherwise, it's dark. And as I, we got near our compound, we knew the people who lived in one of the last houses just before the, the triangular fort we lived in. And it was Christmas Eve night. They were Catholic. And they called us over and uh, offered us something to drink or eat in a celebratory kind of way for Christmas. And we were standing there chatting. Um, I don't remember if we were eating or drinking anything. If I'd been offered a beer, frankly, I would have had one. Uh, and so that could be very likely. But um, all of a sudden, 
the, I was on the end of the village, as I said. <clears throat> the Catholic church was about in the middle of the village. Uh, so this would have been, say, 200 yards away. Uh, in the darkness, first of all, I heard as I was chatting, I heard Christmas music, Christmas uh, no, uh, uh, Noel, uh, religious song and um, of a familiar tune. At first, you know, you're talking to somebody, the music in the background, you don't really pay attention, and then it kind of penetrates a little more, and you realize, uh, oh, they're singing a Christmas carol. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, they were, that was a Christmas carol. And I looked down the in the darkness back down the street where the sound was coming from and in the darkness one little light after another after another popped into view and then started heading our way down the street and it became clear that what was I was seeing in the darkness was that a choir a children's choir was coming out of the Catholic Church, and as they came out, you would see their candle appear, and they were coming down two by two by two in the darkness. Uh, toward where we were. And they were singing, uh, O come all ye faithful. Or, or one of the well-known Christmas carols. And uh, so you could see them coming down, the this, just the little lines of light, you know, coming down toward you. And then when they got to us, and so we were now on the, our end of the village, and when they got to us and got up so I could see them, <clears throat> in the middle of them, or toward the front of them, I guess, I, I don't know where, but along with them, I'll put it that way, there were like four boys carrying, two in the front, two in the back, carrying a creche that they had made out of chicken wire uh, and, and stuffed with uh, uh, very thin, thin tissue paper to make, you know, of different colors to make the, to make the scene. And so there was the manger and the, the baby Jesus and, and Joseph and Mary there. And they, uh, <clears throat> and they stopped there and the priest was there, a young priest. He wasn't the old one that kind of ruled the roost. Uh, the young priest was there and he saw us and he came over and smiling and they all stopped and they broke into the Vietnamese version of, uh, and the, as all of them had been in Vietnamese, it was just the music that I had recognized. Uh, they broke into Silent Night. And <clears throat> uh, I felt so badly because this was, you know, like Christmas night the Christmas Eve night. Uh, this was about a celebration in, in Christianity uh, about the Prince of Peace. And my sergeant and I are standing there armed to the teeth, you know, right by the manger. And I said, this is so wrong, you know, so discordant with what this is supposed to be about. Uh, I was glad they stopped at one level. I was glad they stopped. I was glad they were all smiling and being very friendly and singing this familiar, you know, hymn and, and paying some kind of honor at that sense to me because they stopped there when they saw us and made kind of a production out of it. But uh, I, I remember it, though, more poignantly. Uh, because uh, of that sort of separation of ideal from reality. 
that um, is produced in a war experience like that. A memorable Christmas. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Um, yes. And it is that we live in a country that is historically had its difficulties. It has had its terrors, producing them as well as accepting them. But uh, in the end, when all the ills of our country are weighed in the balances, I truly believe the virtue of freedom will swing scales in our favor because while we have too many that remain behind, who remain underprivileged, and we should do far better as a country, as a society, in encouraging them and looking after them, that we have the capacity and the freedom to live, move, act, work as we will is something that I and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of others, have seen does not exist everywhere. Or even as well as it does here in most places. This is not to say, oh, the America is the best of everything, America number one, you know, and throw your chest out. It's just accepting the fact that almost any way you cut it, we have been a privileged people and that I am proud to have served my country under difficult circumstances. That's it. I am so grateful for your service and those who served with you and want you to know how much we appreciate that. Um, well, thank you. This country wouldn't be what it is without the sacrifices of men and women like you and your families who did without you for a long time with all of the uncertainty that goes along with that. Um, I appreciate that. And in that vein, I would uh, be negligent not to mention uh, not only the 58,000 that died in Vietnam, the over 7,000 so far that have died in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places as well. But specifically, you know, I guess it comes really home to me in the person of First Lieutenant Richard H. Davis, who was my age and of my experience from a small town, well, not from a small town, but from a southern town anyway in Tennessee. Uh, who was killed in his last week in Vietnam on an operation that he volunteered to go in because the new guy had just arrived and didn't know the terrain, didn't know the people, and so Richard was going to help him out. And there are a thousand stories or more, many more, I'm sure, like that, where young Americans freely offer up their life and blood because they're doing not the pleasant thing, but they are doing the hard thing that has come to be their duty. And 
Richard, Dick Davis, never got married to that girl he was engaged to, never had children, never had an opportunity to develop as I have into whatever, you know, that is for, for good of ill, that potential was wiped out in the beginning. A potential for all those thousands that was not experienced by our country and who knows what we have missed because they are not here. Uh, and in that light, uh, or in that Along with that, I would mention that uh, one of my favorite, uh, or at least most trusted uh, NCOs was a guy named Johnny Tester, Master Sergeant Johnny Tester, who passed away not long ago from, from cancer. He's the only teammate I was able to really keep in keep in touch with over, over you know, the, the, the other years, was a really, a, a really good soldier. And again, the kind that just by being a good soldier is doing so much more uh, than we normally acknowledge in our civilian lives because uh, every day is the potential for being in harm's way for the rest of us. Um, and, uh, you know, it needs to be acknowledged, and I acknowledge that here for Johnny Tester and all those that uh, served before and, and after. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Well, I'm glad you came. And welcome home. Oh, thank you.